I call this meeting to order of the Davenport Community School District Board of Directors. Director DeFau, would you please read our priorities? The Davenport School Board establishes the following priorities to ensure the academic success of all students. Provide leadership and direction to improve the overall learning environment in our classrooms, schools, and district, including the health, safety, security, and happiness of students and staff, and direct and support actions, programs, and activities which reduce the impacts of poverty on our students, their families, and our community. Thank you. And Director Crumwoody, would you please read our mission and vision statements? Certainly. Our mission state and statement is to enhance each student's abilities by providing a quality education enriched by our diverse community. Our vision statement, education that challenges conventional thinking, prepares all students to compete in a global society, and inspires our students, parents, staff, and community to answer the question, what if? Thank you very much. Um, before we get started with the regular order of business, I wanted to point out to the board two areas um, that are a little bit different from normal. <clears throat> First is item G, which is the school infrastructure, sales services, and use tax. Um, you'll note that there are four motions included there, and there's <clears throat> we've included specific wording for the motion, especially there are two resolutions, which normally we read the whole resolution into the uh, minutes. One of the resolutions is about 30 pages long, however, and <clears throat> we thought that might be unreasonable to have that read. Whoever makes the motions on the resolution, uh, there's a shorter resolution, motion one, is a short resolution. You can either read it referencing the resolution or read the whole resolution. And uh, motion four is the longer resolution. And <clears throat> you can either refer to the resolution as it indicates in the motion, or if you feel so inclined, you can read the whole resolution. I wanted to point that out. We also have um, <clears throat> on item E, we have approval of, uh, of option one or option two for the bell time schedule. So just note that there are those two options available uh, for whoever makes that motion. All right, with that, we'll move on. Uh, Superintendent Tate, student board reports. Adam, let's start with you. Okay, well, at Central, today was an exciting day because one of our students, Maddie West, was awarded a $20,000 scholarship for going to medical school, and she was surprised with that in the school. And then I was actually able to go to the Rotary Club and accept a $16,000 scholarship there. So Mr. McKissick was kind of glowing all day because of that. Um, we also, this morning, the Central uh, Anti-Bully Group was able to go to Truman Elementary and speak with a class of fifth graders that were in a recent incident about bullying and about being an upstander rather than a bystander, and it went extremely well. We're all very happy with the outcomes, and we're going back Friday. Um, Central Singers Incorporated, our show choir, just got eighth place at Nationals on Saturday. It's a very long day because a lot of us went to Nationals, woke up at 5 in the morning, and uh, came back for prom, which was also very fun. And they did a great job at after prom. It was up for 24 hours, and I'm proud of it. So, <laughs> Okay, um, our art department has been really successful this year. They placed, they had three people placed first, second, and third at the Augustana Sights and Sounds exposure. And our ROTC has also been very successful this year. They competed in a Des Moines tournament and brought a total of five trophies home, so added some more trophies to our collection. Um, a lot of our AP advanced placement tests are starting up this week and next week. And um, this past week on Tuesday and Thursday, we had eighth graders from six different middle schools coming to tour around the school. So they got to school at about 9.45.
and then they were there until 1.30, and they got to see what it's like to be a high schooler, so hopefully that brings more kids into North. Okay, so we had, of course, prom this past Saturday, which is a fun time. Um, our own Hannah Harrington was crowned prom queen. Um, we had, uh, tomorrow we actually have our blood drive, which it will be a good day. Um, usually the student council runs the blood drive, but one blood drive a year, the Joy Club takes over. And since it's a smaller club, it, club, it's a really big challenge for us to do that, but it's a wonderful time. We all get a lot of kids involved in that. Um, then we have, like Hannah said, our AP test next week. And this past Wednesday, we had, it was Wednesday or Thursday, we had, it was Wednesday, we had Hearts for Tyler Day. Uh, Tyler's a f fellow student in our school who is actually in Iowa City right now <coughs> under waiting a heart transplant. And we went around the school, we had these heart cutouts, and all the students wore them, and then um, myself and another student went around, and we took pictures of all the, school, all the students wearing them in the classes, and then we put together a video, and are sending it to Tyler. <coughs> That's all. That's all, Mr. President. All right, thank you very much. We did have a presentation scheduled uh, for tonight. <clears throat> um, it was with the 100 black men of the Quad Cities, and that had to be postponed till a later date, so that will not be occurring this evening. We'll move on to the showcase, Superintendent Tate. Thank you, Mr. President. Williams Intermediate School here, and I uh, would like to welcome and introduce Principal Garrett Eagle. Good evening. Uh, my name is Garrett Eagle, principal at Williams, and tonight I wanted to, uh, we have some staff members and students that are going to talk about a couple new programs to our school. One is uh, 95th Percent, which is an intervention program, and also this year we were able to get Gateway to Technology Project Lead the Way for our intermediate students, and so we have uh, the teacher and students here to present for that also. So at this time, I'd like to have uh, introduce Jennifer McDermott and Amy Skinner to talk about our 95th percent. Good evening. I'm Amy Skinner. I teach 95% at Williams and Jenny McDermott also teach 95% at Williams. Um, Jenny teaches half day in the AM. I teach all day. Um, like Garrett has said, this is our first year with 95%, so um, we're kind of learning also as we go, but um, have seen amazing, um, great accomplishments and some students succeeding. Um, I'll give you a little bit of what 95% is. It's actually a phonics-based curriculum. So this year um, what we did was went over to our feeder schools and any kids that we thought were flagged by um, low SRI scores or low Iowa test assessment scores, we took the phonics screener and tested those uh, upcoming sixth graders. As you can see, the phonics screener is up on the board there. Um, it really hones in on the skills that the, the kids need. And if it's a phonics issue, then they know they are going to come to us and we will um, help them succeed in the phonics area. If it becomes that we see that it's not a phonics issue, it's more of a comprehension issue, then we put them into our Read 180 intervention. Um, if you can see where it says Skill 5, Long Vowel, Silent E, if they're missing some on there, we know that that's the skill that we're going to have to work with. And then it will go all the way into Vowel R, Predictable Vowel Teams, um, Complex Consonants, um, closed syllables, and then it gets into harder phonics issues for um, most of our, uh, maybe our 7th and 8th graders. We see maybe they start with skill 10 is where we would start with them. And then from there we take the phonics screener and we start working with those students. What we did then from there in our classes was worked with our students and then kept a close eye on the data. And when we talk about data, we talk about the scholastic reading inventory, the SRI. So we would keep tabs on our students in the 95%. And we have some slides to show you some of those accomplishments. So this would have been a um, all of our 95% kids. If you can see in the yellow, which I'll let Jenny talk about, we put this together. Um, so in December, we looked at all their SRI scores and compared their growth from fall to winter, and we found that 
Um, 37 students or 61.6% of our students uh, demonstrated growth in their reading and actually 10% of the, or 10 students were now proficient readers. Um, and then we found that 16 students or 26% declined from fall to winter and seven students or 11% 11 11 um, showed no growth or were not tested. Um, and then after that we gave all the students the PSI again to make sure that they were comfortable in all their phonics skills and um, to make sure they're ready to move to their next class which was read 180 or um, a new literature class that we developed. So our biggest hurdle was then what do we do with these kids that are now proficient? We didn't want to just put them into a regular literacy class that was already ongoing and not have them succeed or accomplish. So over spring break, um, I developed a curriculum based on talking with staff members. I went to an ed camp in Bettendorf and talked to some amazing teachers about different um, lexiles that would um, not only get their excitement about wanting to read the book, but also um, show some successes. So we chose the book called Cinder, um, made some comprehension questions, and I have 30 students right now that are in that class that all <laughs> had their nose in that book and I actually had a parent phone call on Friday that asked what the next two books in the series was because her daughter wanted her to purchase them and said never in her years has she had her daughter so excited about reading so we're showing that 95 percent is a wonderful program and it's getting these kids excited and I think the best part that Jenny and I had was calling these students down and telling them that they were going to be going to a um, on level reading literacy class they were so excited so we're still trying to work out some of the you know little loopholes and in, in finding our way through it but we are showing success and I think it's a great thing that Davenport has so that's all we had unless there's any questions Are there any questions or comments? Okay, thank you. I wanted to thank Garrett. Did you have anything else? We have our project lead the way. Okay, Gateway. great. So we'll bring, I'll introduce Mrs. Hemming and she has some students that she would like to introduce. Good evening, my name is Michelle Hemming, and at Williams Intermediate this particular year we started a new program called Gateway to Technology. I know that SMART has already been doing this program for three years and we're pretty excited that we have it in our building as well. Um, I'd like to start though with my after school program. I've had an after school STEM program for the past five or, five or six years. And I have some students here who've worked very hard and we'd like to share some of the things we do after school um, that students stay two to three nights a week just to, to um, continue their learning in the evenings. Um, my name is Therese Taylor and this is my first year doing STEM and I think that is really fun and I'm, I'm going to do it next year. Um, my name is Joan Nguyen, and this is the second year I doing the STEM team. My name is Allison Cheatham, and this is my third year doing the STEM team. My name is Kirsten Cayley, and this is my third year doing the STEM team. The STEM team, we do, we race mousetrap cars, and we have a sample car today for you. We also use journals to keep track of our data and we can draw pictures of what it looks like and sketches of what we want to make it and we can keep track of how far it goes, like in feet and centimeters. Um, we also get interviewed, interviewed to, um, like, to see what we've done to the year and like, what, we, what our progress is. Would you... <laughs> Would you guys like to see our cargo? Yeah, certainly. <laughs> oh 
<coughs> while they're doing this, I just want to say it's been really fun to watch these students learn. And I just found out that at the high school level, they also do a mousetrap cart kind of um, activity. And we have a high school student who comes and works with our kids, they, doing their, um, getting their service learning hours. They come, she comes and works with us, and she said she didn't realize how hard it was to make one until she had to do it for her class, and these girls have been doing it for three years. So. Next year, me and Kirsten will be doing the City High program at West High School because we found this so much fun. We want to keep doing it in this City High program. We're going to be doing the engineering and design part of it. So, are there any questions? Director Snyder. How did you guys find out about the STEM program at Williams, and how did you guys get involved with that? Well, um, in sixth grade, me and Kirsten both had Miss Hemming for math when she taught math that year. Um, so she was telling us that we could do this STEM program where we would mace, race mousetrap cars and do a lot of other things. And so I thought it would be a really fun thing to do, and so did Kirsten. So we got the application, we wrote the paper, and we got teachers to sign it, and we turned it in, and we got in. And I guess putting one of you on the spot, what do you think is the most important thing you got from the program? Oh. That's me? Okay. <laughs> um, I think it's learning to design and engineer things, learning how to make things work and solving problems, is that's been the most beneficial thing that I've learned. Good. Thank you, guys. Director Cole. I couldn't see the propulsion system for what made it go. So I have two questions. What, what is it that makes it go? And two, how do you engineer something that will go faster and better? Because that's the name of the game, right? Trying to make things efficient and make them go far. Yeah. Um, how it runs is, first we have a mousetrap, that's the base. like you would usually put in the middle. What we used is a lever, which would make it like more efficient and like make it go longer instead of like fast and like just go speed. Instead of it would like go slower, then it would end up going slower as it goes. And, and, and how do you, because this is an engineering concept show. course, how do you then is it trial and error, or do you have, do you figure out on paper, like you said, you know, you work things out on paper, how do you make things more efficient? How do you make it go farther? Um, what, like, what I think is the best, like, what makes it go faster is, like, the shape, and, like, how we made this is, like, to break the wind through the air when it goes through the air, like. Aerodynamic kind yeah. of thing, huh? Great, thank you. Director Dickman. Um, so some of you said that you've been in the uh, program for multiple years. Do you build, do you like build each new skills each year? Um, is there kind of a, a first year kind of thing or do you just uh, do things um, over again and you then are you able to help teach kids that it's their first time around? Um, well, the f every year we build a different car, and so in sixth grade we just used the mouse trap, and um, since it was our first year, like we had this big old car, and it was like really long and stuff, and it it went pretty far. But then the next year we came into it knowing more about it, so we made it smaller, so it would go farther. And we still just use the regular mouse trap, but we saw other kids that were older than us that were using like levers and they were like really tiny cars. And so we got different ideas from other people. And so this year we used the lever because we wanted to try that out because we saw that the cars that used the lever ended up going a lot farther. 
And so we thought it would be really fun to do that. And since it was Trez's first year and Dwayne's second year, we um, really helped them out in teaching them how to do it and more about it. And so, yes. That's great that you guys are able to, to refine your skills and then also act as teachers um, to pass on your knowledge. That's that's how human civilization has gotten to where it is so far. I'm just, I'm really excited to see a program like this happening. I think that this would have been one of the coolest things ever if I had had it when I was in middle school. We love it. <laughs> so that's why our after school program. And then we have, with our new Gateway to Technology program, brand new, and I'm brand new too, so there's a lot of learning going on all day long, not just with the students, but with myself as well. Um, this is, these are two of my eighth grade students that are in the um, robotics portion of the Gateway to Technology. Uh, I'm Xavier McLeod, and uh, me and Tracy took this as like a rotation class. You know, we got foods, learning support, and art. art in, and I didn't really know what this was. I thought it was like a computer class, you know, learning how to do a PowerPoint and stuff, but it turned out to be really cool. Hello, my name is Tracy Tran, and this is my first time ever doing this sort of stuff. I never thought that engineering could be so fun. I thought it would be like engines, machines, going around, doing work that more, more humans can do at one time. And when I found out that I could program it and make it go as the way I want it, I was so excited and wanted to try this out for the first time. So they want to show you their car, if that's okay, or their robotic car. No, I mean, you, you can talk about your program. <laughs> I actually designed multiple programs, but I only could show you guys one. And I just choose one randomly and made it go around in a square uh, or any kind of shape that I wanted it to go. This particularly made it go into a triangle shape. And it was kind of fun doing this because I had to do it again about like seven or eight times to get the numbers right negatives and the motors to go in the right direction. The one thing I'd just like to add and why I'm so proud of these two is it's a 45 day program at which point we don't start discussing the actual building of the robots and the programming until the last 20 days. So they have only had tw technically 20 days of instruction mm -hmm. on building. We've, we do other things building after that. We talk about gears and different things. But the actual programming and building is in a 20-day time frame. And these two are just stellar students. They stand out, and they work very hard, and they come in every day ready to go. So I just want to make sure that they get their, um, their kudos because they've done a very nice job. Any, any comments or questions? <laughs> Director Dickman. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, you said it's a 45-day program. Uh, what, what would you do if you had longer than 45 days? Uh, <laughs> there, are so many more, there are so many more programs. I would be able to spend a lot more time on programming. This is so just basic. And, and we understand that in the GTT. We understand it's a basic just introduction. But we're hoping next year to have a rotation where I'm sorry, an elective where I'll be able to teach for a full year with some of the concepts. And then we would be able to build more than just a car. We've got so many different activities that they could do. And with kids, students like these two who really just take to it, it's really going to be a, a great um, motivator for them. So is that something that you guys would, would want to sign up for? Uh, Xavier actually has signed up for City High as well. And Tracy's going to North, so she's going to be in the um, Project Lead the Way program that North also has. Very cool. And GT Gateway to Technology is just the junior high precursor to that. 
Anybody else? Oh, hang, hang on just oh, a second. Sorry. Anybody else? Director Snyder. I asked Dr. Tate if it was okay if board members uh, gave you guys assignments and he didn't really answer me. <laughs> but if you guys can come up with something like that that'll like cut my grass while I'm gone at work, <laughs> that would be cool. And I also wanted to uh, say to Amy and to Jenny, um, your program seems pretty outstanding and I could tell you guys were excited about it and I wish there was something like that when I was younger because I'm still just a horrible horrible reader I read because I know I should not because I want to and I think that would be pretty exciting when you get to tell those kids how well they've moved up and that uh, they're now in an at-level program um, I think that's what it's all about so congratulations to you both as well Director Cromedy. Yes, I just want to uh, thank you, all of you, for uh, coming to us tonight and sharing uh, the things that are going on at Williams. I want to thank the administration. I want to thank the staff and the students. And uh, this is really exciting to me just to think what's going on in the middle schools and to know what you're going to do in high school. I mean, that's really exciting. So um, I want to congratulate you and, and uh, thank you for sharing all of this with us. Thank you for having us. Keep up us. the good work. Anybody else? Hang, hang on there just a second. Here we go. Back here. <laughs> Adam. Awesome. Um, so I'm enrolled in a Scott Community College programming course at Central, dual enrolled, mm -hmm. and I have to wonder, the program they're doing, is it with special software or is it actually a language? It's Robot C. Robot C. Robot is, C. Is it based off of the C++ language or C sharp? Like, do you... I don't think so. You don't think so? So, okay. I, don't know. I, I, was, just, I was curious if this was... Still trans learning. <laughs> well, no, like, I'm, I'm taking the college course and it's... Right. it's what you were just talking about the negatives and pluses mm -hmm. we actually wrote something like that so it sounds like you're taking on college level problems in Jun junior yeah. high and I was just blown away by that yeah and some and some students really do enjoy it I'm, I'm not sure about the other but it's it's a robot C program that we know works um, they use in many of the industries so it might be the same so real, world. real world and we use we also have seventh grade computer aided design 3d so we do that as well The two teachers. Director Poole. I just, um, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do, and, and you explained it so nicely that it's working, is we're trying to make the engineering field uh, a place where girls might be interested. And you said that if it had been about engines and stuff like that, you might not have been interested. And of course, as a guy, I was wondering, you know, if this thing would like climb things and, and do battle with other robots. But you, do you think if it had been explained that way that you might not have ha had as much interest? I would not be, I would not be much as interested when I found out if it was more warlike. But <laughs> I would definitely, because I went to John Deere a visit to John Deere and found out that a lot of women were also in engineering such as chemical, nuclear, and lipstick engineering, um, plant engineering, or regarding to other things in society. So I was really interested once I did some samples of how the things worked in our civilization. Well, your, your thoughts here on the program are very enlightening and, and help us understand that we're doing some good things in terms of helping girls get involved in fields that typically have not been populated with girls. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. And just so you know, our boys are just like you. They all wanted to do a catapult. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, I just wanted to say a couple of real quick words. One is... I really like that sweatshirt. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a great school, and a lot of good engineering goes on up there. Um, and, and I'm just really excited about everything that was presented tonight. Um, both of the uh, presentations, these, and uh, the work that uh, you, Amy, and Jenny are doing. Oh, that's all just fantastic. So thank you very much for the presentation. It helps us understand. Thanks. Thank you.
All right, with that, we'll move on to communications. Um, Director Kluhl, would you read our communications for us down to open forum? Sure. <laughs> Beginning on April 29th at 6 to 7.30 p.m., the Suicide Prevention Awareness and Resources session will be held at North High School Cafeteria. Uh, entrance will be through the main school doors. On May 2nd from 6 to 9 p.m., Davenport Schools Foundation Gala at the Modern Woodman. Um, May 5th at 5.30 is the Committee of the Whole, ASC Jim Hester Boardroom. May 6th is at 3 p.m. the Legislative Advocacy Committee, also at ASC in the Executive Boardroom. May 7th at 4 p.m. is the Policy Committee meeting at ASC in the Hester Boardroom. May 12th at 7 p.m., regular meeting at the Jim Hester Boardroom, and May 20th at 7 p.m., the Kimberly Center graduation, and that will be at the Galvin Fine Arts Center at St. Ambrose. May 26th is a holiday, and ASC will be closed. May 27th, um, 7 p.m., the regular board meeting here in the boardroom, and next up is open forum for community input. Okay, thank you very much. Open forum is a time for members of the community to give input at a board meeting regarding school district issues or concerns. Individuals who want to speak should fill out an open forum request and give it to the board secretary prior to open forum. The board will not act on any issue presented do during open forum if it was not published as an agenda item. The Iowa Open Meetings Law prohibits action on any issue that is not on the agenda. We have four open forum requests this evening. And <clears throat> first up, and, and please come up to the uh, microphone, state your name and address. Um, oh, I forgot to read the next section. The president will set the amount of time allowed for individuals to speak during open forum, and that'll be two minutes. The board asks that no charges or complaints be made against individual employees of the district or community during open forum. Remarks that reflect negatively on the character or motives of any person will be called out of order. We'll start with Cherie Canaday, followed by Jeff Dietz, Jennifer Josend, and Stephanie Dikema. Hello, my name is Cherie Canaday. My address is 7303 Kelling Street, Davenport, Iowa 52806. You ready? <laughs> um, I just wanted to come before you today. My daughter, Kylie Canaday, is um, in the listing for um, <clears throat> the appeals for open enrollment and just wanted to um, let you know that we're very serious about her future and her education. Um, she has separation anxiety disorder, a uh, very hard time going to school, and you, if you look at her past, you'll see it clear back to elementary school. Uh, we feel that, that um, online school through um, CAM is uh, how she would like to finish. She would really love to get her diploma. She only has eight and a half credits left to get, and just wanted to get up here and, and appeal to you to give it some serious thought. Um, I guess that's about it. That's okay. It. Thank you very much. Thank we, you. we don't allow um, question and answers here, so, but we do appreciate your advocating your position. Thank you. Next up is Jeff Dietz. Hi, my name is Jeff Dietz. I live at 1410 Eagles Crest Avenue in Davenport. My zip code is 52804. Uh, I'm here today to talk about the high school start time. Uh, I uh, am a teacher at North. I'm also the head boys and girls golf coach. The girls team is in season and they're currently ranked 10th in Division 4A in the state. Uh, I believe that if the start time is pushed back to 830, that that's going to have a direct and negative effect on our ability to compete. Um, we, in, in golf, we have a unique practice situation. We share our practice facility with one other high school as well as the general public. Uh, there are three nights that we would not be able to practice, at least on the golf course, um, if the start time was pushed back to 8.30. Um, that leaves two nights for 
both high schools um, if we weren't playing, if we weren't, uh, didn't have a meet um, on either of those nights. That's the only opportunities we would have to be on the golf course. Uh, it's not just about golf. Um, I believe we need to take a look at every student that's involved in after school activities and see what the effect of a later start time is on that. Uh, whether it's athletics, uh, theater, music, any of those things, all we're doing is pushing everything later. And I don't think that that's advantageous to those students. So as you're considering the start times, I'd ask you to please consider all of the students. We tend to make decisions, it seems like, based on a small group. I know you want to do what's best. Um, I'd ask that you consider what's best for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Next is Jennifer Josen. Uh, my name is Jennifer Josen. My address is 732 West 58th Street, 52806. I was happy when I saw the meeting agenda included a 755 high school start time as an option. It was nice to see the committee has really listened to the feedback of the parents, teachers, and students in giving this option. I ask you, the board, to choose the 755 start time and show you are also receptive to the points made by all concerned. Classroom time will be affected if the later time is picked. Hundreds and hundreds of kids in the schools participate in after school activities. On occasion, kids now already have to leave school early to get to away games and meets. Instruction time missed will only increase if school ends at 320. Here's a small sampling of four weeks of spring sports. Using a 320 end of school time and looking at bus times at the school my son attends, kids will miss, be missing considerable amounts of the last block more often than you think, making it difficult for teachers and the students. The week of March 31st, boys and girls track would have had to each leave on two days, boys soccer one day. The week of April 7th, girls track would have had to leave two days, boys track two days, boys tennis two days, boys soccer and girls soccer each one day. Week of April 14th, girls tennis one day, boys tennis one day, girls track one day, and boys track two days. Week of April 21st, girls track one day, or girls golf one day, boys tennis one day, boys track one day, girls soccer two days, girls tennis one day. The rest of the year, various sports will encounter this problem as well. Missing the class time is setting them up to fail and is not acceptable. Choosing the 8.30 start time is trading a possible improvement with an unknown number of kids for a sure and certain detriment to other students' achievements in school. Please don't make school harder than it is when you are trying to do just the opposite with this time change. Take the comments you have heard from parents, teachers, and students, and really think what's in the best interest of the students. Please choose option two with a 7.55 start time to show us we have been heard. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, excuse me a second here. I lost track of where I was. Well, there it is, Stephanie Dikema. My name is Stephanie Diekma. I live at 6205 116th Street in Bluegrass. I'm here tonight to discuss the importance of recess in relation to student achievement. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, recess is at the heart of a vigorous debate over the role of schools in promoting the optimal development of the whole child. A growing trend toward reallocating time in school to accentuate the more academic subjects has put this important facet of a child's school day at risk. Recess serves as a necessary break from the rigors of concentrated academic challenges, challenges in the classroom. But equally important is the fact that safe and well-supervised recess offers cognitive, social, emotional, and physical benefits that may not be fully appreciated when a decision is made to diminish it. Recess is unique from and a complement to physical education, not a substitute for it. The American Academy of Pediatrics believes that recess is a crucial and necessary component of a child's development and as such should not be withheld for punitive or academic reasons. Children need to have downtime between complex cognitive challenges, says Dr. Robert Murray. 
They tend to be less able to process information the longer they are held to a task. It's not enough to just switch from math to English. You actually have to take a break. Ogle Jarrett, a leading researcher, researcher on recess, states, there is this assumption that if you keep kids working longer, they will learn more. It's misguided. Indeed, no research supports the notion that test scores go up by keeping children in the classroom longer. But there is plenty of evidence that recess benefits children in cognitive, social, emotional, and physical ways. Research shows that when children have recess, they gain the following benefits. They are less fidgety and more on task, have improved memory and more focused attention, develop more brain connections, learn negotiation skills, exercise leadership, teach games, take turns, and learn to resolve conflicts. They are also more physically active before and after school. Our children currently receive 20 minutes of recess per school day. In 2008, the Iowa legislature enacted the Healthy Kids Act, requiring that all physically able pupils in kindergarten through grade five shall engage in physical activity for a minimum of 30 minutes each school day. I'm asking that our students receive more recess time so that we are in compliance with the Healthy Kids Act and increase student achievement. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. We have a, uh, one more uh, open forum request. This is from Cyrus Zar Zargar. Good evening. Thank you for um, hearing my appeal. Uh, I'm here to uh, speak about the uh, appeal for uh, open enrollment for my daughter, Fatima. Oh, my name is Cyrus address? Sargar. Mm -hmm. My address is 2051 East 60th Street. That's okay. in Davenport. Yeah. Um, I'm here uh, to address the appeal of my, uh, for my daughter for open enrollment, Fatima Zargar. Uh, I'm sure you've uh, read my letter as well as the accompanying uh, letter of support from the president of the uh, local mosque, the mosque in Bettendorf, uh, the Muslim community of the Quad Cities. Um, I thought what I would add just quickly uh, tonight would be uh, my own personal perspective. I'm uh, myself someone who grew up in the United States uh, as a Muslim and as a person of color. And uh, I, I went to the uh, fine school. I went to a Catholic school for most of my childhood. Uh, it was very supportive. The sisters, the teachers, everyone was incredibly supportive. But, but that wasn't the issue. I mean, the problem really was um, something from within myself. I didn't have a, a support group. There weren't others like me. Um, and uh, so it, it, it was a difficult situation for me and my identity growing up. Um, my daughter right now in the mosque that we attend has that support group uh, and, and her friends are not in our district um, and, and I realized that it might sound like a small thing uh, but it's a different time than it was even in my childhood uh, you know after 9-11 uh, there's a lot of pressure on our community and um, it, it would I think uh, impact her positively to be with her support group with her peers from the mosque going to the same school that they are in two ways. First, in, at school, and second, at the mosque. Um, I don't know uh, what she's going to do when she grows up. I don't know if she's going to dress in a distinctive and identifying way. Even if she doesn't, I think that that support would be necessary. Um, am I out of time? Well, you've just got to wrap it up. You've had two minutes. Oh, I'll, I'll finish with this sentence then. Uh, my wife does, my mother doesn't, but I know that in, in either case, uh, it, it does make a big difference, and I thank you for considering it. Okay, thank you. I want to thank all of you, Cyrus, Stephanie, Sherry, Jeff, and Jennifer. Um, your thoughts and your words are really important to the board and to the community, and, <clears throat> and your advocacy um, is really, really important. So thanks again. Oh, now, I apologize. I've got too much paper up here. We'll end that one yeah, of one of these days that will end. Move on. May I have a motion for the consent agenda? Mr. President. Director Crumwoody. I move the consent agenda as presented by the administration. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Call for the vote. Director Crumwoody? Yes. Director Dickman? Yes. Director Cluel? Yes. Director Snyder? Yes. Director DeFau? Yes. 
My vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. May I have a motion regarding approval of bills? Mr. President. Director Kluhl. I move that the board approve the following recommend recommendation from administration for the adoption of bills. The resolution is as follows. Resolved that all claims presented to the board having been duly certified as correct by the secretary, reviewed by the administration and board members, and they are hereby audited and allowed as just claims and warrants drawn in the treasury for the several amounts. Further resolve the payment of claims and salaries be approved as presented for the periods of April 10th, 2014 through April 23rd, 2014 with the following voided check, that being check number 316601, payable to Robert Schneiden in the amount of $175, and the reason for that is that it was to the wrong vendor. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Call for the vote. Director Kluhl? Yes. Director Dickman? Yes. Director Cromedy? Yes. Director Snyder? Yes. Director DeFau? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. We'll move on to the superintendent report. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. I have a letter from the Iowa After School Alliance to Shaney Ford, Director of Stepping Stones. Dear Ms. Ford, the Iowa After School Alliance After School Champions Awards honors individuals or organizations that believe strongly in the importance of after school programs and are willing to provide tangible support to the issue. As a true supporter and advocate of after school in Iowa, the Iowa After School Alliance extends to Stepping Stones the 2014 After School Innovator Award. The After School Innovator Award recognizes programs that have implemented innovative practices to support children, youth, and families in Iowa communities throughout out-of-school time. As Stepping Stones, your program has worked to braid funding streams within the school district to better align programming available within the school building and community. And I have a second letter from the Iowa Academy of Nutrition to Melissa Trimble, the, she is a curriculum department specialist. Congratulations, I am pleased to inform you that you have been selected as the 2014 Iowa Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics GEM award recipient. You will be honored during the awards luncheon at the Iowa Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics annual meeting in November. You have made significant contri contributions in promoting healthy living. Thank you for pulling members from several organizations and businesses together in order to promote health in your county. We're proud of both of these, and they certainly reflect well upon the district. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. We'll move on to other items requiring action. May I have a motion regarding approval of 3801 Marquette Street remodel project. Mr. President. Director Snyder. I move that the board accept uh, administration's recommendation uh, to approve the lowest responsible responsive bid from the successful contractors in each of the 11 bid packages as presented for a combined total of $6,768,614 for the 3801 Marquette Street remodel project. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? If not, we'll call for the vote. Director Snyder? Yes. Director DeFowle? Yes. Director Crumwoody? Yes. Director Cluel? Yes. Director Dickman? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. May I have a motion regarding approval of district wide security <coughs> camera project phase three? Mr. President? Director Dickman? I move that the board accept the administration's recommendation of the lowest responsible responsive bid from communications in innovators of Eldridge, Iowa for $679,970 uh, $970 for the purchase and installation of security systems and cameras. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we'll call for the vote. Director Dickman? Yes. Director Crumwoody? Yes. Director DeFau? Yes. Director Kluhl? No. Director Snyder? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. May I have a motion regarding approval of restroom renovations phase five? 
Mr. President. Director Cromody. I move the administration's recommendation that the board approve the lowest responsible responsive bid from Tricon Construction for $222,000 for the restroom renovations at Monroe and Bluegrass Elementary Schools. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Call for the vote. Director uh, Crumwitty. Yes. Director Cluel. Yes. Director Dickman. Yes. Director DeFowl. Yes. Director Snyder. Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. May I have a motion regarding approval of three-year contract for independent financial audit. Mr. President. Director Cluel. Move that the board approve a three-year contract with I. Bailey LLP uh, for year one contract of $50,000, year two, $52,000, and year three, $54,000. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? I've got a couple of questions. Um, and I don't know who to direct them to. Okay. Who is um, our current contract with? McLadry. Okay. And what is the purpose of um, making the change? We've been with McLadry, I believe, for close to nine years. And their three-year contract was up. And so we felt that it was prudent on our part to um, put out a request for proposal to auditing firms again to see if someone else would come in um, and uh, win the award, basically. And we did have another firm that we will be switching to, which we believe is a good thing because I think once you get with an auditing firm and you get comfortable with them, it's always good to have someone else come in, um, take a different perspective, uh, look at it maybe a little bit differently, but they all look for different things. And so I think it's a good idea that we have a new firm come in and audit the district. Where are they located? Um, they are currently out of Dubuque. And are these, these uh, the contract amounts, are they similar to what we've been paying? Yes, they're very similar. Okay, great. Any other discussion? We'll call for the vote. Director Cluel? Yes. Director DeFau? Yes. Director Snyder? Yes. Director Dickman? Yes. Director Cromody? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. We have a motion regarding approval of option one or option two for bell time schedule. Mr. President. Director Cromody. I move the administration's recommendation that the board approve option one, move to approve option one bell time schedule, which has the high school starting at 8.30 a.m. This schedule will be in effect beginning with the school year 2014-15. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Director Dickman. Um, I I know that the board got a lot of comments on uh, on all of, on the board times and that uh, that changes were made um, so that to to try to accommodate some of the comments that um, everyone had written in with. Um, after reading all those comments and and seeing the the schedules, I know that clearly not everyone will be happy. Um, I. I'm doubtful that even 50% of the people who wrote in will be happy. However, um, changes have to be made because of things that are that have been handed down by the state, and um, I I know that the vote that I'm planning on taking uh, might not win me a lot of friends, um, but I'm I'm making the going to be making the best decision that I think for for all of the schools at all levels going forward. Any additional discussion? Director Snyder. I guess I want to reiterate my concern with an 8.30 start time, and that's, as a board, we have two main objectives for this year, uh, two main goals, and one of them is to reduce the impact of poverty 
uh, within our community, and I'm really, really concerned um, that pushing the start time that late is going to interfere with a lot of kids' option to be able to work um, to support themselves, to help support their family, um, or also force them into choosing, do I want to work to um, help support my family or to cover my expenses, or do I want to participate in extracurricular activities? And there is so much evidence out there supporting that the more activities kids are in, the better they do in school. And I just really am concerned that this is going to interfere with that too much. Um, this is a budget neutral item. Um, there are changes that have to be made to be in compliance with the 1,080 hour. Um, but changing the high school start times, in my opinion, is not a necessary one that needs to happen right now. Any additional discussion? Excuse me? No. Adam? Uh, based on what <clears throat> you just said, I think of this, I think of the phrase, time is money. And if we were to say that high schoolers' time is worth minimum wage, if we just put a number to it, that half hour multiplied by all the school days, multiplied by all the high schoolers, you're looking at a potential loss of the equivalent of $2,618,000. If you take minimum wage for that half hour times all the students times all the school years, so the fight against poverty, that's potential money, potential work, potential extracurricular time that's being taken away by choosing option one over option two. That's just my opinion. Carolyn? Okay, I, um, I would say obviously for option two and not having the high schoolers start later, there's many reasons. One of the biggest is obviously the extracurricular activities, cutting that. With certain activities like our drama and show choir, we're not done until 9.30, 10 o'clock, and that's getting out at 2.35. If we weren't to get out till 3.20, we may be there till 11 midnight. Who knows? And then that's obviously homework time after that because the activities pile up. And then by pushing the activities time, well, the school time past, you're also making kids choose which activities. You're cutting their involvement because if they have to be home by a certain time I mean parents my parents didn't want me at school at 10 o'clock they're definitely not going to want kids at school at 11 30 they're going to have to cut activities cut rehearsal times and that's just going to be detrimental to a lot of things also one of the advocate one of the most um what's the word the hope for I believe what you're hoping for is with the start time is that kids will sleep more and this seems like a very weak argument, but changing the start time later isn't going to make kids sleep more. I mean, th as a teenager, they're going to look at that as, a, as an opportunity to stay up later. This past term, I didn't have a first block. I didn't need to be at school until 9, 10. I did not go to bed at my usual 10 o'clock. And that's how the mindset of teenagers. I can speak as one. They were not going to sleep more. I mean, there may be some that actually do utilize that, and it's probably the better thing to do. But that can't really be a good argument for that, I don't believe. Hannah? Um, I know that our coaches and directors in our school are very proud of the fact that students can participate in both sports and music and drama and all activities in general. And I know that in other cities in Iowa, you have to choose between sports or the arts. And I feel that if we change the start time later, that means that we get out of school later. And that means that students are going to have to choose between sports and music. And we, the, ki the best kids in the school, parents, teachers, coaches, people will argue this, are the kids that are involved in all of the different activities. And so I feel that if the start time is pushed back, we won't be involved in all those activities and we won't necessarily have the encouragement that we do to stay involved and stay on top of our grades because we'll be worried about getting to bed later because we're not getting home as early because we have to be at school later and at school later for all of our activities. 
Is there any additional discussion? Well, I've got some. Um, cool. Actually, I oh, I, do. I thought you were just turning on your microphone. I apologize. It, it was a subtle gesture towards okay. saying, yes, I do have all something right. to say. Director Cluel. I, I think we're all compelled to talk about this because it is such an important decision in the life of our schools. Um, certainly the issue that, that Director Schneider brought up about poverty being one of our priorities is, is very important and in some ways this does appear to be contradictory to the best interest of that priority. Um, however, these are never easy decisions and student achievement is also a primary goal uh, of, of our district and of this board. I, uh, I believe, first of all, that we did go out in good faith and had community forums and we talked with the public about this issue. Um, frankly, I think we could have done a better job because if we change the start times, if we change it to an hour later, there's no guarantee that students will make use of that time and may in fact just go to bed an hour later. So what we failed to do is we fail, failed to develop a contract with parents and students saying that okay, if we do this thing in the better interest of student achievement, parents and students will work with us on making it happen. Because frankly, if, if parents and students don't enforce those bedtimes, this is probably not going to be entirely successful. So I wish that we could have done a better job with that. And only in retrospect have I learned that. Um, nonetheless, I believe that we have in our forums listened to the public in terms of start times. We've we've changed things. I mean, having children go out uh, and waiting at bus stops at six o'clock in the morning was clearly wrong, but those changes have been made. Uh, we've backed off uh, the start time for high schools. Um, I, I believe that I am troubled because I know that this is putting a hurt on our community in terms of changes that are going to be have to made. It's not only the athletics parts. It's those high school students that have historically been able to go home and take care of middle school and elementary school children. Um, there's going to be a lot of parents that that can't happen for now. There's the, the single mother or, or, or two parents who have jobs that are pretty fixed in terms of the times that they need to be there. Uh, some employers are going to be very slow to make changes. This is a cultural shift. So what we're asking the community to do is a very hard thing, and that is to be at the lead of something that is important in terms of the education of our children. The research is there. If we do this, we can enhance the learning capabilities of our students. So I will vote to approve option one because I believe it's the best thing for our district, all at the same time realizing that this puts a burden on our community. Uh, but I, I believe that I was elected to make decisions that were in the best interest of our students in our community, and I believe that this is the best decision that we can make in that regard. Any additional discussion? Uh, Director DeFau. And I have to say that this is uh, one that I have been conflicted on, and I've, I've landed on both sides of the fence during the course of this, uh, this dialogue. Um, and the, the thing, compelling arguments have been made, um, no question about that. Um, the thing that troubles me though is that when people look at the shift in start time, they look at everything else being constant and we know everything else won't be, can't be constant. S other schedules will have to change. Do I expect any coach or director to have rehearsal until midnight, we know that's not going to happen. We, we know it's not. Um, so, you know, I think that a lot of assumptions are being made of facts, not in evidence. Assumptions that, um, you know, nothing else will change, that there'll be no, no movement. Um, I think this is going to be a year of hard decisions. 
no doubt about it, and this is just the first of many, and others that will be much more painful, that people will be much more opposed to in terms of trying to resolve the budget deficit that we're going to have to address this year. Um, I think at this point in time, it's only fair to support our administration and the superintendent's recommendation and the committees knowing that it wasn't a decision made lightly and with full consideration of the consequences. Anything else? Director Dickman. Um, something that Director Kluhl had mentioned uh, reminded me that um, the, the community reaction um, it, it wasn't very long ago that the, the option one and option two was uh, presented to the community and to the board. Um, so I'm concerned that the, the community um, will feel that we're making a decision without getting their input on this specific proposal. Um, but it is also my understanding that um, for schedules and contracts to be um, signed and, and whatnot, the, the decision needs to be made tonight. Is that correct understanding is that a question I guess <laughs> superintendent Tate would you like to answer that for the community we need to make it a, you need to make a decision as early as possible the world will not fall apart if you didn't tonight but I've got to say going out again I think we're going to get exactly the same comments as we did before if I thought it was going to be different I would have suggested let's <coughs> go back out as we did with boundaries but there's just not many other ways I can do this. I mean, we've tried and we've got the smartest people in transportation, so either the high school is going to be first or second, so I, I don't think going out would do much more except get about the same res response as we could, and that would be up to the board. I, I don't want to force an issue if you feel like we need more, but I, I'm, I don't think we'd get much in the, in the way of different comments that would help me decide what else I could do. I don't know what else I can do. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Any additional discussion? Director Crumwitty. Thank you, Mr. President. I think it's pretty much all been said. Um, change in anything we do in our schools is very difficult. You know, as a past administrator in a school, if I would change the school time by five minutes, I would have concerns brought forward to me. Um, and I didn't have all the research and information that we have had from this committee that has spent hours looking at this and the changes and the positive changes that we hope will happen from this. Um, we listened. We listened to the public. A lot of concerns were brought forward. And uh, our administration, I think, took time to make adjustments to the original recommendations. And um, like Director DeFaw has mentioned, it's a change. And people are going to have to change. And we're all going to have to change to adjust to a, a different situation. So um, my past experiences have been uh, yeah, it might be difficult at first, but we will adjust and we'll be able to make the changes and it'll smooth out. And uh, I think it's in the best interests of our students to make these changes. And uh, uh, Director Kluhl indicated, you know, there we have some we have some goals that we have, but our number one overall goal as a board of education is to improve student achievement and from the information that I've received from this committee and the research that they've done and from our administration, uh, we hope, uh, we can't guarantee, but we hope that this is going to improve student achievement in our district. So I will certainly support uh, the recommendation. Director Snyder. Um, I have a question for administration. I had not seen this option two presented until I got my packet on Friday. I'm just curious what about or what brought about this option two, and who is actually recommending this option? What I was trying to do is avoid us going too many more meetings without you being able to make a firm decision. So when last you discussed this, I felt that there was a a firm. Um, 
opinion from several of the board members that going with the 8.30 start time would not be acceptable. So what I was trying to do was give two options so again we could discuss them fully tonight and perhaps make a decision. Uh, my recommendation is to go with option one um, and that's the most I can say. It's just a matter of trying to be efficient and move the, thing, the things along. So it's my idea to, to give two options. Anybody else? Uh, Elise? Um, I just question what first brought this up. Um, I know, I just am wondering if you've seen a decline in um, student performance and student achievement for years, or is it just this year that you first considered it? What a great question. Superintendent Tate, would you like to field that? Sure. Um, I, I don't know if it's come up before, but we were required by the state to make a decision on whether to go to 1,080 hours or 186 hour days. So I put a committee together to look at that. When we started to review that, we saw that many of our schools had different start times and, in fact, different teaching and learning times, some as many as three weeks. So I, we had to fix that, too. So we're shoring up which, to, which recommendation, and we finally said 1,080, and the board accepted that. Then we were adjusting the hours, and we also decided someone brought up uh, there is a lot of research concerning high school start time. So I think several people have been thinking about this for quite a while. So our group did research and looked at whether it was worthwhile to make a recommendation. And the more research we did, the more we looked into it, um, there is firm uh, indications that starting later, and 8.30 seems to be about the time um, or later, that it would assist with student achievement and many other things that students do, socialization and so forth. So it wasn't done lightly. I certainly looked for descenders. I said, bring me other research. Let's look at it. We had a little bit. But the preponderance of research really was that this will help. So that's how it came about. Um, you can blame the committee and me, but I couldn't let it go without bringing it to the board for their consideration. Uh, Elise, did, did that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just like, and what, how will you evaluate student achievement in our district? I mean, I don't know how other districts have done it, but how are you planning on doing that? Superintendent Tate? Great question. Uh, we have all sorts of assessments. If we're looking at mainly how students are doing in the classroom, um, we can certainly look at the Iowa test. We can look at, at AP scores. We can look at our district assessments, our end of course tests. So it's just, there's just a plethora of things we can use. We have a district student achievement team. It's a group that meets once a month, and that's what we do. We look at all the assessments. So if the board were to make this choice, I'm sure they would be asking me very soon to give us an idea of how it's going. So that would be the group that would use those sort of assessments. Plus, the board has as one of their two priorities to improve the climate of the district. And um, they'll be determining whether this change, again, if they approved it, did in fact uh, approve the climate. Are people uh, better off? Are they happier? So there's a couple ways that we'll look at it, but they will be asking me and, and making me show what the data is. Um, excuse me, Carolyn. Okay, so I guess maybe I wasn't, um, it was kind of more of a joke because obviously so we're not going to have rehearsals till midnight. That was kind of a ridiculous exaggeration of what's going to happen. But obviously, if we're going to start um, later, then obviously rehearsal times, everything are going to be cut. But then also, since if we go with option two, well, no, yes, option one, um, then there's that for the high schools. There's that 45 different, 45 minute difference in the morning. What do you think are the changes or the possibilities of having? other rehearsals or practices happen in the morning. I wonder just if you had thought about that happening. I have a talk to link with the principals and uh, Mr. Scott, you want to talk a little bit about that? And there has been discussion with the uh, administrators to in regards to whether it be classwork or activities before school with the option. They feel that it will be an increased opportunity. How many take part of it? I can't say at this time, but I know they feel at least it's an option. Hannah. Okay, I was looking through the start time 
little packet that we got and there's the paper on the back that talks about all of the days and um, times that they would be dismissed early from school. If we're looking at the best interest of the students and we want the students to be in school for this long amount of time or the scheduled amount of time, how is that in the best interest of the students if we're pulling them out of school? earlier since we, they have to be at these scheduled events. As you know, uh, that's happening right now. And uh, this will extend that somewhat. Uh, more or less, there's uh, almost 400 athletes, if you look throughout the year, that would be doing that. Um, what I've asked the um, athletic coaches to do and our athletic director, and he's already started to look at this, is are there any efficiencies right now? Can games start a little bit later that we have? Can we uh, transport, you know, start a bus a little bit later? They have to be there an hour ahead of time. Um, the coaches say that there's not a lot of give there, but that would be a challenge they'd have to work on because uh, what we need to do is minimize all the, the time out of classes. Uh, some of the principals have said, well, what we could certainly work on, especially for senior athletes, is try to make sure that they're scheduled so they have electives, perhaps that last block, or or, or less um, stringent courses that they would be taking. Um, so there would have to be a lot of work that would have to be done because we'd want to try to minimize that. But you are right. If we start uh, later, then they're going to miss some more time for athletics. Adam. Uh, going off of that, you talked about measuring achievement, but achievement isn't just in tests and assessments. It's also in how kids do in sports and activities. And the missing class, I think it's also important to look at what time they're missing, not just how much time. Because the block schedule, the way it's supposed to be set up, is you have an hour half of class. The first half hour is supposed to be teaching. The second half hour is discussion on said teaching. And last half hour is then work on what was taught. Um, right now, most of the people that miss class miss that last half hour. So that's work that they can then do at home, they can make up. But if we go to the 320 dismissal, they're now missing 60 minutes. So they miss the discussion on the work and the work at home. So now they have to do the work at home without getting a chance to really see. If they don't, if they don't understand what's being taught, they don't have a chance to learn it in class anymore. And the idea of putting all 400 athletes in less strenuous electives on fourth block during their seasons i wish we could do that now but that's that that seems like asking the impossible of the counselors to try to schedule something like that carolyn this is kind of a question going with what adam just said if we were to go with option one would that eventually turn in favor for the traditional schedule for the high schools do you believe I can't answer that, Superintendent Tate. I haven't given that any thought at all, so it certainly isn't anything to do with this recommendation. Uh, Director Snyder. I want to reiterate one comment that uh, Carolyn had brought up, um, and it's something I've discussed before. Um, when we start later, that's going to leave that school building open in the morning and right now most of the high schools you know they start seeing kids about 5 30 for practices for swimming for um, various activities um, there's still going to be kids in those buildings in the morning there's going to be practices that are going to be forced to move uh, rehearsals there's going to be things going on in the morning so it's going to be counterproductive for these kids getting that extra sleep they're still going to be at school doing the different things if they want to participate in them and I'm just really concerned that we're putting too many restrictions um, on these kids to participate in the extracurricular activities because those are what help these kids define themselves um, with things other than reading, writing, and math. It's what helps them find their individuality, helps them find their interests, helps them basically evolve into who they're going to be for the rest of their lives. These activities are important. Anybody else? Well, I've got several comments and questions. Um, 
And one of the first, I didn't really have time to review the information that was given to us uh, earlier in the um, open forum, but it says that the subrule 12.519 under physical activity requirement basically requires um, pupils in kindergarten through grade five shall engage in physical activity for a minimum of, of 30 minutes. And I don't know if that's, if that, is that a real rule? I, it says it's from section 281, but, and it says adopted and filed, but I don't know whether that's the law. I don't know if the administration can respond to that. Well, Brad, you may want to work, walk, your, walk your way up. Uh, yes, it is the law, but it includes the recess as well as uh, the PE that they have during the, uh, the day, and you may want to comment also. So if, if that's the case, if that's the law, then it, we're, we require 30 minutes a day for basically elementary, including PE, and you're saying that we do have PE plus recess every day of plus 30 minutes. Plus recess when it requires 30 minutes of physical activity. I'm, I'm doing this off the top of my head. I haven't looked at it for a little bit, but I know when this came in, the place, and you can also include uh, activity time both before school and after school. If you have something organized, that can also count as part of that 30 minutes of activity as well. So it's all that combined. It isn't just 30 minutes of recess. It's 30 minutes of physical activity per day. So I'm asking, do we provide 30 minutes of activity the way it's defined for every student in elementary school? When you look at recess as being, and somebody did a report here where it looks like we provide somewhere between 15 and 20, 20 minutes, I guess, per day, right? Right. So the question is, do we do 30 minutes per day absolute without question yes. I would I, I couldn't say definitively for sure we do but we're very very close to that yes between when you when you look at the recess time when you look at the time that they spend in physical education uh, and again when you look at activities that you can offer both before and after school all of that counts towards that 30 minutes per day I understand but okay so tell me how much physical education do they receive in elementary it uh, varies from school to school a lot of schools are on a three-day rotation where a child will it rotates physical education art and music and so they will come in every third day. Generally, it's about 40 minutes if they do something like that, 40 to 45 minutes that day. Um, some schools will, especially with the lower elementaries, uh, grades will take that 45 minutes of time and they will split that in half. So I'm gonna spend say 20 minutes in physical education two days in a row, that other 20 minutes would be spent in music, that third day would be in art, so Okay, that's fine. Creative. What, but what I think I hear you saying is that even if they got a full 40 minutes twice a week, that would be 20 minutes twice a week plus 15 or 20 minutes five times a week, which would not come up to 30 minutes. And there's a purpose for me asking these okay. questions. Um, so then when you say we offer other programs before and after, and those may be allowable, but they would have to be attended, wouldn't they, before they could be counted? I would have to go back and look at the how the rule's written, whether or not it's required that a student participate or that simply you do offer that programming either before or after okay. school. I don't uh, look. So that's sufficient on that area, but I will say that my concern is that if this is the rule, and if this is what, our, what we're really doing, mm -hmm. I'm very concerned that we haven't even considered recess time as part of our start and end times, our bell times. And so <clears throat> if this is the case, and I'm thinking we're trying to bank time, we're trying to do all these things at once, um, are we even meeting the requirements that the state has applied. I don't need an answer right now. I want to continue with my thoughts. Um, if I can find them, there we go. Uh, actually, I believe that both option one and option two are recommended by the administration as Superintendent Tate indicated. And so, 
Um, I don't believe that option two is a is is not supporting the administration recommendation. I believe that as they're positioned, it's simply two options, and so I don't I don't have a any difficulty in supporting one or the other and still supporting a recommendation. When uh, recently we had a discussion and the uh, Bell Time Study Committee was in front of the board and they talked about the reasons for um, changing the bell times and the sleep was not indicated as even one of the top three issues. And, or I should say, I, I want to correct, it was not represented as one of the top two issues. Um, from my perspective, the research still has not been compelling with respect to late start times. I think the, there is some compelling research that talks about sleep, and I think sleep is probably really important for all of us, uh, including me. I try to get a lot of good sleep if I have something really important the next day. And I'm sure that, that students try to when maybe you want to, or, or you can, but you do have all these uh, other activities, you're doing things, you like to stay up late at night, and once you get to college, you're probably gonna stay up really late. Um, You know, the loss of time, I, I intended actually to do some calculations. I was going to do a spreadsheet on the, on uh, Mr. Oates' spreadsheet here that talks about the number of days and minutes that are missed by all of these. And, and there was a number thrown out earlier that it affects about 400 students. And I wanted to figure out how much actual time are we losing. Um, it's hard for me to do that calculation on the cuff right here, but it, it definitely will decrease the amount, and as Adam was indicating, it may be the wrong time to be taking away from students in that fourth block. Um, if you're taking away from not only the work that they have to do, but the discussion about it, and to me, when we talk about student achievement, it's really, really hard for me to say that the, the research that, from my perspective, is not compelling, saying that kids sh in high school should sleep late uh, is a stronger position with respect to student achievement than um, taking them out of class. I, don't, I think that taking them out of class is obviously not consistent with our, our hopes and our efforts uh, to help increase student achievement. Elise brought up the whole issue of measurement, and I thought, man, this is going to be really, really, really hard, uh, if not impossible. Um, there may be ways to do it. I think that all of the efforts that the administration, that the board, and that the district is making when it comes to student achievement are part of what helps increase student achievement. To measure the effect of a late start, um, I think, would be extremely difficult, um, but I think it's a fantastic question. And if there were a way to measure it, and if we demonstrate next year, if we say, wow, this late start, all we're doing is getting sleepy kids in here, and we've got poor student achievement, then I hope that, that somehow this might be reconsidered. Um, I guess I've already talked about it a little bit, but, but one of the comments that was made was that the preponderance of the research um, supported letting uh, high school students sleep later. and. From my interpretation of the research, the preponderance of the research said that more sleep was more important. And the, the getting up later and the melatonin and all of this, I think, was uh, somewhat 
extraneous. Um, I think I th think I want to go back again to the administration representation that the two I think there were two original uh, real thoughts. One was to go to 1,080 days, and then another was to allow the flexibility. I think that some of the um, uh, bus issues and busing, trying to make that more efficient, probably played into a lot of this. But uh, at this point, I would ask uh, if you'd respond at least to the 30 minutes. Um, I think that's really the only question that I had. The issue of whether we're doing 30 minutes of uh, physical exercise is a great one. We're, we have to look and see, and if we're not, let's assume that we find out it's 20 minutes a day, then we'll have to find that 10 minutes within the 1,080 hours we already have. It'll just be a matter of, of adjusting the, the day, whether it comes from um, reading, whether it comes from math, but you know we have flexibility during the day. So it's a great question, and certainly that's one of the things I do want to check and see. Are we following it? And if not, then we'll have to make adjustments because we owe that to you. But but I guess you're saying that either option uh, would still accommodate that without any additional changes. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, is there any additional discussion, Director Snyder? Uh, just one final one. Um, I guess I just wanted to point out and make sure that we all understand that the 7.55 a.m. start time, option two, is still delaying the day. Um, it's still pushing it back um, some, so we're getting close to that 8 o'clock, which seems to be the magic uh, number that's been thrown around. Um, so even going with option two is still pushing that start time back some, um, but yet is uh, kind of a happy medium um, that I think that... Uh, the public would be very grateful for. Adam. Okay, so I crunched the numbers because you challenged me. Um, <laughs> on the sheet with the current schedule, um, the sports people are losing 2,360 minutes or 6.5 school days each total. And with the new schedule, they'd be losing 6,254 minutes or 17 and a half school days. So over six and a half times more time lost with um, option two or option one. Sorry. Can you give me that in total uh, person school days, for instance? You said 17.5. 17 and a half more school days. More school or, days. No, sorry. Um, 11 more school days missed 11 more and an average of 400 students is what somebody said so it'd be 4400 student school days yes okay thanks for that hannah uh, last comment i promise um as the schedule is right now i'm already and i know several other kids do too but i'm already going in early in the morning to get help with ap classes and other classes in general and after looking through the packet it says that principals would be able to offer that extra time in the morning for practices but if people are leaving school early to go to those games and still have practice in the morning when is there time for kids to have that extra help and go in and get that extra help every day I know I'm in AP stats just about every day in the morning and making that start time later and having principals use that early time to use those practices won't benefit kids, I feel like, in the least, so. Thank you, Director Dickman. Sorry, I, I know this is going long already. Um, this whole conversation has centered a lot on the high school start, start times because that has been um, something that the community uh, was very upset about and um, we're all obviously very concerned and want to do what's best for our high school students. Um, but I'd like to point out that we also have middle school students and elementary school students. Um, and the elementary school proposal is very similar for both option one and option two. 
um, but there are some changes for the elementary school and there are definitely changes for the middle school. Um, and I, I, I think that it's important that everyone recognize that we're casting our votes on this not just based on the high school start times, that we're also considering our, our elementary students and our, and our middle school students. Any additional discussion? Director Clough. Well, six board members, six very divergent thoughts in terms of what we need to do. And I, I think this is all healthy. I did want to respond to a couple of items that uh, President Johansson brought up that, that uh, I have a difference with, one being that options one and two um, were both supported by the superintendent. I think clearly the superintendent has indicated that option one is, is preferred. And I think very clearly that the, um, the bell time committee recommendation is much more aligned with option one than option two. Um, in terms of research, um, I, I don't think that the melatonin research is extraneous. I think that the Bell Time Group spent considerable time doing this research, uh, more than probably any of us board members have. And um, I myself as a biologist know that there are specific issues in in the stages of growth, and if a 15 to 17 year old has um, has um, has these issues, as the Bell Time study has brought out, and melatonin is an issue, I, I don't think that it can be called extraneous. I think that's uh, somewhat uh, somewhat of a, of, of uh, an assault to to our Bell Time study group to say that the research that they came up with is extraneous. Um, and, and you know this this whole issue. Of, of change is, is hard. You know, nobody really was excited about Social Security, they weren't excited about Medicare, and they certainly, as we all know now, weren't excited about affordable health care. These are programs that were important at the time, and they weren't popular. But leadership did it because they thought they were the right things to do. And so it, it's hard, it's hard as a board member to sit here and listen to some of the compelling arguments that, that you students and the public have made and say that I hear it, but I think that the research, I think that the work that the administration has done has led us in the right direction towards student achievement. Again, my only concern is that if we don't have that, that cooperation, that handshake with the community and students, it, it won't work, but I hope that we are all interested in student achievement and not only the board but our community will support these efforts to try to enhance the education of our children. <coughs> Director Cromody. Yes, I'd just like to follow up with uh, Director Dickman's comments. Uh, although the motion does have to do with high schools and the high school bell schedule, she's absolutely right. This committee spent time researching the elementaries and the middle schools. And what we found out was that we have children in this district, they're not getting the same amount of time in their educational program as other elementary students. And so all of this connects. The high school connects to the middle schools, to the elementary, and, and as a past administrator, I can tell you there was a couple things that dictated how we operate our schools and transportation is huge because we can't run all the buses at the same time so you have to you have to space them out but when I heard about the inequity that we have in this district with our elementary education program then I became very interested in doing something different in this district to make sure all elementary kids are getting the same amount of education time and that's not true at this time so that's one of the re major reasons that I'm very supportive of changing this and because of that it also impacts middle school schedules and high school schedules anything else Carolyn okay. um, this this is kind of again connecting with not just we've done and we have done a lot of talking about the high school um, but I mean, obviously, families are going to have to change, regardless of which option is chosen. Change is going to happen. It's like my mom likes to say, change is the only constant in life. And there are sacrifices that are going to be, have to be made. 
Um, but uh, with the high school getting out later than the elementary schools, are there because some parents aren't going to be able to change their work schedule. Maybe financially they can't afford to have a babysitter to um, fill that gap. Are there after-school programs or something at the elementary schools that could possibly assist with that? I don't really know what sort of programs we have at the elementary schools. But are those kids go? I don't, we can't send them home alone if they're four or five, well, five and six-year-olds. Just kind of wondering what was going to happen there. Do you have an answer, Superintendent Tate? We do have um, stepping stones. You heard me read a letter about them getting an award, and, and certainly that's available before and after school. Um, it is certainly a concern, and um, we would certainly work with families. We just unfortunately can't solve it all. We know those things are going to happen. Almost any way you do the schedule, somebody's going to be um, have to make serious changes in their family, and, and that's why... It's hard to do this, hard for me to make a recommendation, hard for them to approve any of this because it is going to make a change. So it's just a matter of, yes, there are programs available and there are programs outside the school system available and, and families would just have to avail themselves of that and we certainly assist all we can. Anything else? Director Snyder. I guess just one follow-up comment to that is, yeah, there are programs available, but unfortunately, they're fee-based, and that's not an option for a lot of families in our district. Anything else? Well, I've got a couple more comments after all that. Um, you know, <clears throat> the, the information that was provided to the board from the superintendent uh, in the packets it talks about the bell time decision information. And in the second paragraph, it says, in the process of studying bell times, an overwhelming amount of research concerning high school start time emerged. Hence, under superintendent's direction, the group picked up a third objective for the bell time study, to re bell time study group to review. So the third objective, and remember that the first two, one was the recommended state option for attendance was the 1,080 hours versus 180 days. That was a pretty easy um, decision to make, I believe, by the board. Second was equalizing the instruction time among all schools, which seems like a reasonable uh, effort. And third was high school start time. So it was, it was discussed that high school start time, when we talk about High school start time, I think it's because it was established as one of the goals of this committee or group to look at. And so, <clears throat> sure, this is going to affect all of the schools, but since this is how it was prepared, uh, I think it's reasonable to assume that the high school start time made some sense because the committee was looking at it. In one of, in the second or first paragraph, first full paragraph on second page, says the major detractor from option one is that three large, the three large high schools will get out 45 minutes later than the current schedule, increasing the impact on athletes who have to get out of their last block early in order to attend competitions. Two paragraphs later, it says the board's challenge is to weigh the preponderance of research concerning the positive effects of a later start time with the potential increase in lost class time for student athletes. And, and I think when, when we look at it in that manner, if we look at these two differences, what I hear some of the board members saying is that they believe that there must be significantly more student achievement by changing the start time for the uh, high schools to 8.30 and that that easily, and I, I do say easily because there must be a, a very compelling uh, reason to move to this really late start time which has been expressed as student achievement and that that easily outweighs this detraction that's even mentioned in uh, the document from the superintendent. For me, it's not that easy. I can't, 
I can't say that I want to lose whatever the number was, 4,400 days, 4,400 student days of lost time, and that I'm going to make that up by letting um, high school students sleep later. Director Snyder earlier talked about um, option two as being a modest change, and it would still increase by 10 minutes. Um, the It would allow students, I guess, to sleep 10 minutes later if that's how it's being looked at, which it sounds to me like that's what the s several board members are saying, is that that's really the essence of this, is that allowing students to sleep later is the overriding uh, correct decision here. I think, I think that <coughs> all of us are allowed to look at research in the manner that we want to. The, the thing about this particular study is that it never had anything to do about sleep. It was talking about the recommended state option for attendance and equalizing the instruction time, and then later on the high school time. Uh, it was even represented by that committee that the sleep time studies were not, I, the way it was represented to me was that that was not a compelling uh, and not a significant part of the reason for the uh, recommendation. One of the things is I read through, you know, the comments that we received, we received a lot of comments. A lot, a lot of comments. And I wish I could have captured some of them, but, but one of the uh, threads I think that was in there is that this is creating, I, and I believe it's true, that if we adopt option one, I believe that we're creating an awful lot of turmoil. And we say, well, change is good, and we talk about leadership, and all these things are correct. But, but again, from my perspective, without having that driving evidence that this is the right thing to do because of melatonin, when that was not even part of of the reasoning for it, it's really difficult for me to get behind it. Uh, it's probably pretty obvious that I'm strongly opposed to option one. However, I would um, support option two if option one fails. But option one is what's on the uh, table right now. Is there any additional discussion? Director DeFau. Yeah, and uh, for clarification's sake, um, I would let you know that the essence of my decision is not based upon an extra 10 or 30 minutes of sleep for students, but research that indicates that districts that have made this decision have experienced lower truancy, lower absenteeism, higher student achievement, and less behavior problems in the classroom. You know, it's not just a matter of does my student gain 30 hours of shut-eye in a given night? And it's interesting that today in, in thinking about this decision and looking at some of the research and um, some of the articles that have been presented to us, there was one from the New York Times that talks about how people actually, you know, use lack of sleep as a badge of honor. Well, I, I only had four hours of sleep last night, and then I put in a 20, you know, 20 hour day or whatever, you know, that I can do X, Y, Z and still perform with this little sleep. And that, uh, you know, it almost becomes a negative attribute that, you know, you seek to be well rested and prepared for your day and that, you know, oh, well, I can accomplish that with this. That's great. So. Okay, thank you. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, we'll call for the vote. Director Cluel. Uh, I apologize. Director Crumwitty. Yes. Director Cluel. Yes. Director Snyder. No. Director Dickman. Yes. Director DeFowl. Yes. And my vote is no.
Motion passes. Thank you. We'll move on to open enrollment denial appeals. May I have a motion? Mr. President. Director Dickman. Uh, I recommend that the board um, accept the administration's recommendation to uphold the superintendent's decision to deny open enrollment between districts based on the district's diversity plan and board policy 501.116 open enrollment between districts for the following students who have appealed. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Director Clue. Again, every every time this issue comes up, when the superintendent makes these recommendations to the board, it's it's heartbreaking for me because the advocacy on behalf of students, uh, on the behalf of parents for their students, is compelling. There's nonetheless, the board has given very clear direction to the superintendent to apply the policies that the board has approved. And I support that. My only hope is that very soon we will no longer need to have this open enrollment restriction where we don't allow children to leave this district when their parents and they find it to be in their best interest. So I will support this motion with, uh, with difficulty. Any additional discussion? Director Dickman. Um, this is my, my first time experiencing this, um, and it, it really is as, as heartbreaking as Director uh, Kluel has referenced. Um, my, I certainly hope that, that, the, that open enrolling is, is not the only option. I, I, reading these situations, I, I think that there are other options that hopefully um, these parents who clearly care greatly for their children um, can look into um, either um, changing schools within the district or, or finding uh, another option of, of some sort. Um, but, but this is our policy, um, and until we change policy, I think it's we have to reluctantly enforce it. Anybody else? I have a question on one specific. Let me let me ask it non-specifically. Um, I had a little bit of trouble understanding the policy as it applies to uh, online an online school, and I was wondering, is that is it exactly the same in the application of the policy? Is there any difference in an online school versus a, um, a real building? Not this <coughs> online school, because if they enroll, then uh, we lose our uh, per student uh, allocation from the state the same. And this is the only online school they can actually apply to. We have online options within the district, and I'm hoping that I can you know, work with the parent and the student because, again, we don't want to lose anyone and we try everything possible. So that would be my hope w with the case of, of online to try to provide them options internally that they can do and perhaps we have more than they know. But no, sir, it is just like any open enrollment um, for that particular course and we have to treat it uh, when we do the calculations just like an open enrollment to a district. My understanding was that it was a, it wasn't a course; it was a uh, a school, and I guess that's one of the differences between our offerings would be courses, I think, instead of a school. Is that correct? Well, except with our, we don't just offer people apex courses, for example, and leave them alone. We have a, they're in a either a school or another setting, and they have people to work with them. And I don't think it's different than we have with the online a school that they can open enroll to. I mean, I, I can't imagine they would have any more um, attention to with human beings than we would provide, so. But. Okay, thank you for that. Any additional discussion? Okay, we'll call for the vote. Director Dickman. Yes. Director Cromwody. Yes. Director DeFowle. Yes. 
Director Kluhl? Yes. Director Snyder? Reluctantly, yes. And my vote is yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Please remember on this next vote that we have four motions, and you should have a sheet at each one of uh, your places with the highlighted motions. And <clears throat> so I'm going to ask for four separate motions, and we will uh, vote on each one before we move to the next one. So may I have a motion regarding motion one, uh, regarding the $9,535,000 school infrastructure sales services and use tax revenue bonds series 2014. Mr. President. Director Kluhl. In regards to the tax use revenue bonds uh, stated, I move that the following resolution be approved by the board. That resolution being Resolution appointing paying agent, bond registrar, and transfer agent, approving the paying agent, bond registrar, and transfer agreement, agent agreement, authoring the execution of the same, as indicated in attachment A. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Okay, we'll call for the vote. Excuse me, because we have a little bit extra paperwork on this one. Uh, Director Kluhl. Yes. Director Dickman. Yes. Director DeFau. Yes. Director Crumwitty. Yes. Director Snyder. Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion carries. We'll move on to motion two. May I have a motion? Mr. President. Director Crumwitty. In regard to the use of tax revenue bonds, I move that the form of tax exemption certificate be placed on file and approved as indicated in attachment B. May I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? We'll call for the vote. Director Crumwitty? Yes. Director DeFau? Yes. Director Dickman? Yes. Director Kluhl? Yes. Director Snyder? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. May I have a motion re regarding motion three? Mr. President. Director Kluhl. I move that in regards to the sales service and use tax revenue bonds that the form of continuing disclosure certificate be placed on file and approved as indicated in attachment C. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Call for the vote. Director Kluhl. Yes. Director Dickman. Yes. Director DeFau. Yes. Director Crumwitty. Yes. Director Snyder. Yes. And my vote is yes. May I have a motion regarding motion four? Mr. President. Director Dickman. I move the resolution authorizing the terms of assurance and providing for and securing the payment of school infrastructure sales, service, and use tax revenue bonds. The resolution is as follows. Um, resolution authorizing and providing for the terms of assurance and securing the payment of 9535000 school infrastructure sales, service, and use tax revenue bonds series 2014 of the Davenport Community School District, State of Iowa, 
and providing for a method of payment of said bonds as indicated in attachment D. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? We'll call for the vote. Director Dickman. Yes. Director Cluel. Yes. Director Snyder. Yes. Director DeFau. Yes. Director Crumwitty. Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. Now before we move on to discussion items, I just want to ask Marcia, is everything in order the way that every we did everything? And we passed every motion that you needed. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, we'll move on to discussion items. Textbook adoptions is first. Thank you. I panicked a little bit. I couldn't see Julie back there. But she's <laughs> <laughs> You're on, Julie. Well, it's that time of year again. We've gone through the lengthy process of the textbook adoptions and are bringing to the board tonight adoptions totaling $420,253, give or take a few, because when we finally do the order, it's not always exactly what we um, you know, have in the, the original quote. These adoptions this year are for AP Psychology, Chemistry, Geometry, German, physical science with a chemistry base and physical science with a physics based, a physics um, course and pre-K math. All of the books, or many of these books um, have extensive um, electronic resources that go along with them. For ex in example, interactive whiteboards. Um, several of the adoptions also have e-books associated with them. So I guess now we're here for answering questions. Great. Thank you, Julie. Mm -hmm. um, are there any questions? Director DeFau. I presume you're going to bring this forward for approval next yes. the next board meeting? Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, the geometry curriculum that's being purchased, will that have any bearing on the honors geometry curriculum that's being offered in the high schools is there a component to that um, textbook adoption when we do an adoption it usually reflects upon both the the regular course and any honors course so that um, there may be supplemental materials for the honors course but uh, in general now Alyssa's not here right now because she just had a baby but in general that's how it works is we use that textbook and then supplement so the honors geometry will have a textbook yes. as opposed to the honors algebra this year? Yes. Okay. Um, in looking at the recommendations and reflecting upon the current state of the, the projected budget for next year and thinking about some of the very extreme measures that some of our here districts have had to make in this last year you know, it strikes me that all of these adoptions except one is core curriculum and that would be the German one two and three um, don't get me wrong I was on this board when we removed there was an effort to remove German from north and fought to retain that by the same token, I do know that Iowa City just removed German from their curriculum because of the budgetary decisions they had to make. And I'm, I'm just uncertain about approving that curriculum, knowing we're going to be having conversations coming up that may, in fact, impact programming and... Yeah, like I said, beyond that, all these other adoptions are really core curriculum based, and I can't envision us, you know, cutting any of those courses. But I, I think it's maybe premature, and I'm wondering if we set that curriculum aside, how soon 
you know, what's like the last date that we could adopt that and have it implemented? We, um, in general, these do not go out until July 1st. Okay. So uh, the, the reasoning is, is that anything that we purchase has to be in the district during mm -hmm. that fiscal year. So on July 1st, these are upstairs in purchasing and boom, they go out so that we get our books before the beginning of the year. Okay. And I know that's rather controversial and I just trying to keep everything on the table that we possibly may need to look at as we're looking at budget next year. Were you kind of done with your thought mm -hmm. there? Okay, thank you. Additional discussion? Director Crumwoody. Julie, this is not going to be a new conversation. I think we've had it for the last three or four years. Whenever a textbook adoption comes up, the other evening there were, I believe, four or five of us that attended a session at the AA with Dr. Edwards, and I believe he was from South Carolina? or North Carolina, one of the Carolinas anyway, noted author, uh, noted superintendent of the year in several different situations. He's from a district that has very similar demographics as Davenport and his entire district from kindergarten through high school does not use a textbook in their school. Achievement has increased and um, so we're sitting there thinking why aren't we doing more than this and I know that this has been brought up before. Um, I've always been very supportive of textbook adoptions but now I'm beginning to wonder why aren't we moving more in that direction uh, with, you know, like Director DeFoss said, this is all core curriculum. There are other ways of implementing besides textbooks. It may be uh, cost us less and uh, we're seeing districts like his that achievement is improving. So I'm just curious as to what what the committees that are making these recommendations, have they looked at that? And how much information do they have that they can provide to us as a board so we can take a serious look at that? Because like Director DeFoss said, we're going to have to make some serious decisions about budget. And this is a, this is a pretty hefty uh, budget item right here. So we have can you help us? Okay. We, for example, in the area of math, and we knew that um, we were not aligned to the Iowa course, so we have spent, and I can actually give you figures, of the amount of money that we've spent in writing curriculum that at the high school level that aligns with the core. When you do that, um, you miss out on a lot of resources. For example, the e-books, the PowerPoints, the um, all of the all of the bells and whistles that really do supplement and make the curriculum come to life. In our district, we would have a, an incredibly hard time ensuring that we were had a guaranteed and viable curriculum without having a textbook as a resource. The textbook isn't the curriculum because we write the curriculum to go along with it, but this gives the teachers the resource to refer to for students to have something to read. Um, the amount of printing that we're doing in the area of math, and I think that Nikki can, has experienced some of this, is, is incredible because when you don't have a uh, textbook all of the all of the articles all of the lessons everything has to be printed for the students so as far as a cost saving factor I really don't think that that would come to fruition well Julie can you get all of these in ebooks most of them but some of them are not ready for ebooks yet but everybody has to have a platform and I think right. And you're, but yes, everybody has to have a platform, mm -hmm. but you're talking about that they don't even have any kind of an adoption, correct? 
Right. That's they write their own curriculum. From the presentation. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that's, again, we need some strategic discussion within the board, and Director Kluhl and I have talked to this about before, because, again, everybody's got to have a platform to start with, and we know what kind of investment that is, and so we cannot ignore that. Um, Meanwhile, I, I don't see that next year, the year after, the year after, but, but I personally would like to work uh, now that Gary's back and try to come up, what is our strategic thinking and philosophy, and at least get it down on paper no matter how year, years out so we can begin to show that the next adoption maybe is not <laughs> books, but we're doing e-reader, so I agree with you. Okay. Director Dickman. Um, you mentioned that uh, many of the textbooks also come with an ebook copy. Yes. Would there be a cost savings if we just acquired the licenses for the ebooks instead of the print versions as well? Um, it, in some cases, yes. So, for example, what they're doing, what these companies typically do, is they'll give you when you buy the student edition, then you'll get the ebooks free. Right. So they give you many, many free things. So if we had to just buy the e-books, they would, they wouldn't, you know, they would charge us, and it would probably be similar to what the textbook would have cost. Okay. What the textbook does is it provides that classroom resource that um, everybody can, you know, be reading the same thing, be on the same page, or or have the same reference materials as they're working in a group, um, and even though we're, our students over these years, and, and it's too bad that our student board members aren't here, um, they're getting better at using ebooks. They're more familiar with it. But there is also research, and this probably isn't the greatest time to mention research, but people that read electronically tend to skim more. And one of the things that people, when they have an actual hard copy of something, tend to read more deeply. So. And when you think about that, think about when you're reading something electronically, how you do tend to um, skim it much more quickly than you do when you're actually reading something. So there's still a time and a place for textbooks. Thank you. Director DeFau. And I just would follow up to say until the time that we can ensure that every student, every family, every household in this community has wireless then we can have all the ebooks we want in the world and and there are students that will not have access to those materials you know, i personally know of families in bettendorf where they do have ipads where they have to go to the library or some other place because they don't have wireless at their home and that makes homework very cumbersome because those facilities are only open certain times and certain hours of the day Any additional discussion, Director Kluhl? Yeah, and Director DeFau's comment goes back to the priority of poverty. Again, it's an issue for us that we need to deal with. I just checked. Um, um, it's interesting. Uh, North Carolina, Dr. Edwards uh, was in a district that was probably had the, I think, second highest poverty rate in the state, and they found a way to, deal, to do it. Um, also, North Carolina is, is under the Common Core as well. So they found a way to work under the Common Core with electronic text. Um, we're soon to be a one-to-one -one, um, district. It's it's coming our way. I uh, I don't know how many of these um, how many of these textbooks um, or, or or these uh, curriculums are ebooks. Uh, geometry, chemistry, and physics. And are the ebooks supplementary, or are they the course material? They are the course materials. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain to me? I didn't. I didn't quite understand the software adoption request. I'm sorry. I want to go back and say, um, guy just whispered that German is also. So is the AP Psych. An AP Psych. Okay. 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 Now, would you mind asking your question again? I, I wouldn't mind at all. Nice of you to ask, though. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't get very far, though, if I wasn't nice about it. Would it? Um, it's the, um, the school software adoption request that's included in our package. I, uh -huh. I, don't, I don't really understand what that is. Can you explain that? Um, when we have an adoption, we, um, we 
usually take our request up to LIS because they want to know what it is that we're adopting and make sure that the, whatever it is is going to work with our system. So that's um, what that does. It just makes sure that um, uh, everybody knows what's going on. Okay. Uh -huh. Do you get enough input from LIS in terms of moving forward with electronic media? Um, I think that we've made um, some pretty good leaps and bounds in the last year or two. I'm, I'm excited about the work we're doing. Um, we're putting Chromebooks next year in, um, 20, in a set of 25 or 30 in every language arts class at the high school. This summer we'll be training all of those teachers. And with our new teacher leadership and compensation system, we'll also have all of, all of those um, new people trained to be able to use Chromebooks so we're gonna have it's just gonna start a groundswell with more um, opportunities using Google for education mm -hmm. yes I, I, th I think we're moving forward we're trying to get the um, smart boards in the classrooms that don't have them um, I think Gary's got a plan for how to keep moving forward with that so yeah, and I'm really impressed how the technology committee and Gary are moving forward in terms of making sure that the um, the whiteboards the Chromebooks are being used, utilized uh -huh. adequately. I think that's a very progressive thing that we're doing. Um, last thing is, is, is just to wrap up with the culture. We've talked about the culture a couple, a couple of times tonight, and we've talked to, before you and Jamie were on board, we've talked to our students about um, electronic uh, books, and they're all reluctant. They don't want to do it. Um, but again, I, I think it is something that we in, in light of our economic situation, in light of being a 21st century district, we need to move forward, I think, with intention uh -huh. in terms of utilizing electronic media. I mean, it, it's the same thing with student achievement. You know, how many times do we have to see another district that is making it happen uh -huh. before we realize, too, that the impediments may not be as great as we think they are? So I really hope that that next time you come forward with curriculum proposals that we see a definite movement forward in terms of utilizing electronic media. Right, and with n now with these other two that um, Guy just said were also electronic, I mean, we really have made, it's, it's happening through the companies that are, are creating the um, textbooks that they know they need to go electronic. Yeah, and I appreciate the movement forward. I would just like to see it expedited. Mm -hmm. with and I think that being on the technology committee myself I know that they are working these issues and trying to make sure that we're not moving forward in a faddish fashion mm -hmm. that we're thinking these things through and the people are very smart on that committee so I think in working with them we can come forward with with a strategic plan along with the one-to-one -one, uh, Chromebooks to make this happen yeah and um, if I've heard reports that the city's looking into um, internet access for, you know, the city. Maybe that would help us a lot if that happened to you. Oh, our new library director down in, in Davenport is very serious about that. Uh -huh. so. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any additional discussion? Uh, I've got a few comments. Um, the Chemistry, geometry, and physics are probably all high school. Yes. Right. Um, I, my sense is that we have to be doing more digitally. Uh, over the weekend, there was a presentation, I think, made by the teacher of the year. Uh, I think her last name is Wesling, and she was talking about getting the, the kids involved at a very early age. And... And uh, Dr. Edwards, I thought his presentation was, his presentation I thought was very compelling um, for a whole lot of reasons. And he did talk about getting the community involved uh, and engaged, and there was a lot of culture or cultural issues involved there. Um, I think it's the board's responsibility from a leadership perspective to address this issue soon and to help set a strategic 
direction for the district with respect to this. And I think that if, if we set the goals or the guidance that we want to move here, which is something we've all kind of talked about, but I don't think we've actually set, then I believe that we would move forward in that direction. And I think, um, as Director Cluel was, was discussing, probably sooner than later. And um, so I think it, from that perspective, I, I would ask the board to be a little bit more um, mm, strong, I guess, in its, in its establishment of direction. Another thing I was thinking with the idea that Director DeFau <coughs> was talking about and with some of this discussion on digital uh, methods and your representation of the importance of books, I was just curious what your thoughts would be if we set the whole adoption aside for one year. Um. Because we're implementing the Iowa Core, and we're, we started with ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade, you'll see that here we are. The ones that we are adopting are all the next step in the Iowa Core. So we'll have students coming into these courses next year that, without an adoption, they will not have aligned curriculum to the core. And one of the, if you were to think, now, um, we have to have every student, it, there's some variations that, which I'm not gonna, you know, get into, but kids now have to take um, a chemistry, a physics, these kinds of courses. So if you think about our traditional high school physics course, or our traditional high school chemistry course, and we're now talking every student has to take these, you've got to have a much more hands-on, um, real life situations type, kind, kind of curriculum so that every student can be successful. And so that's why um, these adoptions are coming up is because of the Iowa Corps. And, and you probably mentioned earlier, and I know it takes a while, but how long does it take you to come up with a recommendation, say for one specific uh, Book? adoption, yeah, like the AP Psychology? How long are you studying it before you get to the point where you can make a recommendation? They, it, it can take from the entire school year or for example, for the math adoption for elementary, that will um, th take as a total of two and a half years. Okay, thank you. Is there any additional director defile? Just for clarification, we could though differentiate the German adoption versus yes. the other core curriculum. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any additional discussion? Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Um, one thing I failed to realize, oh, you can go oh, ahead and okay. sit down. I failed to realize that it was already uh, past nine when we started. And normally, once we go this far, we try to have a brief recess. Um, we have some significant discussion left. We need to talk about our facilities, strategic plan, our action plan for board priorities, and a budget discussion. Um, I wanted to thank those of you in the audience, Vera, Dr. Brockington, and Rebecca, as, as well as all of the administration um, for staying with us this long. <clears throat> but at this point, I'd like to uh, have a four-minute recess, and we'll come back and um, follow up on our discussion items. All right, next up is a discussion on the facility strategic plan. Superintendent Tate. Thank you, Mr. President. We need to continually refresh our strategic uh, facility plan, and Marsha has prepared several uh, pieces of paper. One is our, our current plan in a little bit uh, simpler format, and we're just looking at the uh, years when the actual project will be done. And she's also going to update you on some additions that we've had and then also talk about some brand new issues that have come up 
um, that eventually we'll need to have board um, approval on. Um, and so I'd like to her just sort of take over and march you through this. This is certainly just discussion. And uh, there's still a lot of work to do, on, especially some of the new items. But I'd like to just start there, if you would, Marcia. Um, on the copy that you've got that's in color, I guess I just wanted to point out what the different colors meant. I tried to keep this as simple as possible. Oh, this, the one with several sheets, because I'm passing out the yes. one sheeter. Oh, okay. 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 Um, if the if the item is in red, um, that means that it's a project that's already underway and that it's in progress. Um, if it's in purple, it just means that we are funding it through the uh, bond sale that we just had. And if it's in green, it's a project that was proposed to be funded through the bond sales that we're having in 2015. And then if it's not highlighted at all, it just means it's coming out of our regular annual allotment of the uh, sales tax dollars. What I also added to this list is those items that are going to be on an annual basis that will be coming out of this fund, um, such as now we have the debt service on the bonds um, that you've just approved. And we also have to have a reserve set aside for those bonds. So that will be, um, well, that won't be an annual. That will be a one-time reserve that will set those dollars aside. Um, also on there, we have two categories where we've listed additional projects that we'd like you to consider. And that is additional projects that can be funded through PEPL. And then there's also two projects on here that would be funded through the loss or the save fund. And through PEPL, um, the first project is land acquisition in the central area. Um, there's an opportunity that has come up that we can potentially purchase some property that would provide us more parking on the central side of the street rather than on the opposite side of the street. And so that opportunity um, we've listed here. Um, we've also added ASC, and you'll see a little bit later, um, the operations center. Um, security issues, um, security entrances for both buildings. Those are two buildings that typically have not been included in either local option or PEPL funded projects. When the project lists are put together, um, the director of operations typically will go out to the building, walk through a building with the building administrator, come up with a list of projects that need to be funded. That's never been done at the operations center or at the ASC. And so it, going through these phases of security, um, Scott had recommended that we look at doing secure entrances for both the ASC and the Operations Center, so we put these on the list for your consideration. Um, the next area is the Center for Creative Arts, and that is leasing costs that would be associated with that project. And the leasing is appropriate as a PEPL expenditure, and so that's why I put that under that category for additional projects under PEPL. Um, and, we also and that large amount is a balloon uh, leasing amount so that it will take care of uh, the renovation we need to do to turn the downstairs and the library into three classrooms. And we're currently working with a with the library board uh, 28E agreement. So that's not done as yet, but um, that's the way we would hope to do this is, is take care of the initial uh, work we need to do to renovate. And then thereafter, you can see um, the 14490, that's a year, right? That would be an annual. The annual rent, after that. Right. Um, the next project then is Mid City High School um, leasing an additional floor. And the floor that's being proposed is not in the building that we purchased, but in the building that connects to it on the same level as when you walk in. Um, and that don't have the square footage in front of me, but that is um, additional space that's being proposed. And if I understand correctly, it would be used for um, music rooms, um, PE, conference space, re-engagement center, and robotics. Um, and we've been working with um, the hospital and the dollar figure that you see there is um, an estimate of what it would take to renovate that space. And again, that would be an upfront um, lease payment. And then the dollar figure that you see over to the right-hand side would be what annual rent would be um, based on the square footage that is in that space. That's also to be our tornado shelter for yes. 
um, the uh, academy, Keystone Academy, as well as um, the Mid City High. Correct. Because of the lay of the land, um, it actually, even though you walk in on the same level, it actually is underground. With one side of it, the, I believe it's the north side is, does not have windows. The south side is all windows. If that's, if I got my directions correct there. Um, and then another Pebble project is capital improvement request that we've received from um, the YMCA at north and at west. I can expand on that a little bit. The um, We have a representatives from our board meeting with representatives of their board, and we have to continually review our contract. And uh, in the midst of this, they have asked for $236,000 that we put into projects for the West uh, YMCA gym air conditioning, tile work in the North YMCA locker rooms, tile work in the West YMCA locker rooms, West YMCA lockers and installation, and North YMCA handicapped entrance door. Again, these are still under negotiation uh, with the uh, the combined group. But again, I want to at least put it there so that we you know that we will uh, possibly be discussing that with you. And then the last two projects <coughs> that we've added is, as additional both fall under the, the uh, loss funding. And the first one is for the ASC, the HVAC replacement. Um, the system in this building is in dire need of replacement. And again, it was not placed on any schedule um, as other buildings were. And so we wanted to bring that to light and add it to the list for consideration. And the last item is the Davenport Learning Center additional renovation. Um, that was originally on the facilities plan as the Kimberly Center. It was over a two year period of time. The dollar amount that's listed there is not suggested to mean that's what we're going to spend on a renovation. It's just the amount of budget that was left from the original facilities plan um, that could potentially be spent to renovate the Kimberly Center or what is now the Davenport Learning Center. And then at the very bottom of that sheet, to give you an idea of where we're at with funding, is that at the end of this year, um, we project that we'll have $20 million in our in the local option fund and this is just local option now and then at the end of 2014 15 we'll have seven million dollars 15 16 four million dollars and then 16 17 about 14.6 million dollars because we will be through the the um, major projects that we have scheduled on the long-range plan and how about pebble how do we stand there um, Pebble is, pr is um, pretty close to having um, the same fund balance as local option. We currently have uh, around $12 million fund balance um, at the end of last year. So far to date, I think we've spent around $4 million. Um, Pebble has quite a bit more in it because the projects that we've been focusing, <coughs> excuse me, we've been focusing on in the recent years have all been from the local option side. So the fund balance in Pebble has been growing. So with these major projects scheduled, um, we will have more funding in our Pebble Fund than what we will have in our local option fund. And just for a point of reference, when we passed um, the revenue purpose statement for the local option dollars, um, one of the caveats is that we could use that funding for the same purpose as what we can use Pebble. So if you're wondering what fund things fall into, typically we've had the larger projects fall into local option and our maintenance type projects fall into the PEPL, but local option also can cover items that PEPL can fund. Is there any more to the presentation? No. no. Okay. Is there any discussion? Director DeFile. In regard to the central land acquisition, is there enough property on the central side of the street to um, eliminate the removal of the tennis courts and the relocation of Brady Street? I mean, could that be a, a push in terms of space? I'm going to defer to Eric or Dan. To could you come up to the microphone, please? It's not that big. 
I would have to look a little closer at that. Um, just eyeballing it, it would be close. Um, the intent also is to provide more parking. You know, with the project, we are at a positive gain of about 80 spaces overall um, using the tennis courts. So the intent was, and some things still need to be worked out with the city to make that parking lot available on the north side of Central. To if that would so the intent was just to provide and get a larger net gain since we will yeah have larger crowds there now too with the expanded pool and expanded auditorium so that was the original focus but that could definitely be a possibility you know I haven't looked at the lot size to see um, where that falls as far as parking spaces actual counts are yeah, and I understand more is more yeah. but um, yeah, and looking at the transportation costs that we're assuming forever in terms of transporting mm -hmm. the team up to Brady Street to practice and yep. all of those other costs, it seems to me that it might be something we may be willing to consider again in light of budgetary constraints that we're going to be facing and knowing this is capital expenditure, not general fund. Any other additional discussion? Director Dickman. Um, for the ASC, um, something, I don't know if it was in this or a different, um, was that the operations would potentially be moving to a different building. So would it be um, advantageous to, to do the replacement or if we're potentially um, not keeping the building. I don't know if that was part of if the the moving of the um, administration would mean that we wouldn't keep the building. And then if we aren't keeping the building, then would it be better to not do the replacement? <laughs> You're talking about the ASC, yeah. this building. Yeah. Um, that has been looked at in the past as part of budget savings, and certainly um, it's something we need to discuss in the future. So we we wouldn't until we were get got past that. We wouldn't go sink any money, you know. But that, that's a good point. We'll have to, we'll have to settle that discussion first before we do that. Okay, thank you. Um, and then also, um, I was I've been visiting school buildings, and I noticed at Sudlow, I think it's Sudlow, that the um, the office is in the second floor. Um, and in this world of safety concerns, um, they have to buzz someone in and tell them to follow the stairs up to the office and then go off to the left. Um, and that, that seems concerning to me, and I don't know if there's a good way to remedy that, and I, I don't think there is probably, um, but that would be something that I would like to at least have looked at. And then also that they only have one computer lab, um, and that often is tied up with some form of testing or another. Um, so with all of our, our push to do one-to-one -one technology um, to see if we could find space or another way to have more computer access in that building. Thank you. Any additional discussion? Um, something Director DeFau brought up was that, yeah, these are capital dollars, but one of the things that struck me is that probably most of these capital expenditures have operation expenses attached to them in the future. Is that a fair kind of guess? I would say as we're doing renovations, we're always looking for efficiencies, so I believe that would be a correct um, estimation of that. So we're looking for efficiencies, but also if we're adding space, we probably increase, most likely, we increase our operational expenses. If we're adding additional square footage, we may. Right. right. And if we add additional parking spaces even, we have plowing and whatever costs there are. Right. And those all would come out of the general budget, yes, right? Yes, that's right. So I'm, I'm thinking about our budget and I'm thinking as we try to find a lot of money and we're going to find it in some difficult areas and yet we may actually be exacerbating the situation somewhat um, by adding operational expenses when we 
put in a capital project. So I don't know whether there's a way to gauge that or guesstimate that, but it might be something, especially on these bigger projects, um, that at least would help us understand you know, how we're affecting the budget even though we're spending pebble or, or lost money. Sure, that, so. no, that's a good point. Um, I was curious about that leasing the additional floor at Mid City High. That seems like a lot of money, and that's an upfront lease for expenditures, basically. Is that correct? That's correct. So, but the building would still be whoever we're leasing it from. Correct. Right? We would have a 10 year lease. 10 year lease. And then the 89000 would be a monthly? Annual. Annual? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I just have to see that a little bit more. It just seems like a lot of money for um, for basically improvements. And and my understanding is that the current space that we own has a suitable location for um, a tornado uh, uh, safety area, whatever it would be called. Is that correct or not? Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. And I thought it was, I even though, even just the portion that we had. If I was the, for the Mid-City High School principal, uh, if I had the opportunity, I would probably go to this lease area. I would take them, even though the building is secure, if I got a warning, I would probably walk into that lease area just because it's a, even a more secure area. I understand if we had it. I'm just saying that seems like a lot of money for a tornado space if we have one that's already suitable. Yeah. My understanding is the Mid-City building is currently equipped for their students. Okay, great. Thank you. Could Any advantage of the Keystone? Yeah, because we have sure. been, we have been, and we've never talked about it specifically, but it has been brought up several times that the, the building uh, has some potential issues with tornadoes, and we, we have to go somewhere with the Keystone students or do some construction at the building itself. So, um, this would probably be in lieu of some very expensive construction also to take those students across the street, which I think could happen pretty quickly. So it, that's all things we need to be talking to you about. Um, and I just wanted to mention, Eric um, came up and um, told me that the award for 3801 Marquette remodel that you voted on this evening did include the um, renovation costs that we have listed here for that lease space. Okay, any additional discussion? Director Dickman. Um, do we, who is it that um, would look in, look for efficiencies in terms of um, like adding solar panels to roofs or changing to geothermal heating? Uh, who is it that will be uh, looking for those things now? Um, that will be um, Mike Maloney, who's gonna be our new um, director of operations. That will be one of the things that he will do as he goes through projects. Okay. Director DeFau. Yeah, I'm, I'm just not clear. Did I miss something? Because I certainly don't recall part of the documentation we received addressing that there was leased space included in that motion. Um. Yeah, it was in well, it's in the plans and specs. I don't know if it was specifically identified as the lease space. It was um, the reason when we went through the programming, we did need the additional square footage, and that's why it was proposed. We needed this additional square footage. There's an activity center for the PE requirements, and then also some additional space for the music, and then also the reengagement center. And so it was proposed, and in the plan sets and the bid and specs that you got, it was in that. Um, but not specifically identified as leased space. It was in, in the plans and in all the documentation, it was proposed lease space. There's the three-story building and then the proposed lease space. So, and then for the efficiencies of the cost, when we, the cost you were presented was combined because 
it more efficient and more cost effective to get the pricing for a larger project and then instead of doing two s individual smaller ones. So that's why it was combined as just under the title of the renovation of 3801 Marquette Street. Perhaps I'm the only person that uh, failed to notice that, but I would question whether any other board members recognize the fact that that's what we are approving. Are we still under cost with, with that doing something with that leased portion? That does put us over a little bit the, with the leased portion, and that can always be backed out of the contract and be as a credit. So. Yeah, and, and I apologize for the confusion. I think it did, it did creep in, mission creep, and it wasn't exactly as uh, clean as I would have liked it. So um, I need to, again, you'll have to approve if we go and add that lease portion, and so we need to make sure the project doesn't go moving in there too quickly till we get that board approval. Okay. Okay. We already approve it. Additional discussion? Yes. Director Cromody. Now I am confused because I thought we just approved it tonight. So do how do we undo what we did? Well, I don't think you need to. I just, that particular portion of the project, as he said, we just won't go forward so you won't spend the money if, in okay. fact, you decide that's not a wise thing to do. Okay. So you, you've, you approved a certain amount of money, and um, I, I just need to make sure that before we use that particular portion that you agree with what we're doing in that lease space because that's a conscious decision you needed to make. So that will be brought back forward yes. to us? Okay. Yes. Additional discussion? Um, yeah, you know, and I, I've got to comment on this because that's, I guess, what was in the uh, motion it was just the total 6.7 million, and that's that's indicated in the bid tabulation summary uh, that was presented. And my understanding, Eric, is that the lease costs are kind of mixed up in this uh, bid tabulation summary. Is that Not right? The lease costs themselves, just the capital improvements to completely demo out what's in there and put it back the way we would want to use the building. I understand, but, but the way that this is going to actually occur legally and financially, I believe, is that that will be a lease, right? It's not, and so it's, it's hard for me to, to, um, to understand how those get mixed up exactly because we, because technically, if it has to be a lease, and I understand you can probably pull that out, the 1.1 million or something, <clears throat> but it wouldn't be capital because it'll be a lease payment to somebody else, even though it's capital improvements that we're making. Mm -hmm. We're making capital improvements, but since we can't make, um, we can't improve property that the district doesn't own, um, the owner will actually be making the capital improvements and we will be um, paying them back as prepaid rent and, and so upfronting it in our lease cost. Although we will be the ones that will be um, um, setting up the contractors as what's, what was included in the bids. What's, uh, and there's a sense of urgency to getting all this done, right? Yes. So you, you're going to be moving on it tomorrow. Yes, that was the intent. Uh, and so if if we're going to hesitate on this piece, does that affect you in what you have to do? It does to a portion. Um, it affects that portion of it. Um, we can still we can still start working on the three story building and we can do that. There will be some minor effects because you know, with the efficiencies of bidding it as one project, we did gain some efficiencies. We may lose some of that because right now the three-story building is completely demoed and um, ready for construction. They have not entered the lease space yet because we haven't given permission. But now that they've done and they can't, if we do hold off on this, they're going to have to pull off site 
and go somewhere else. So it does have some impacts in that. So then they're going to have to remobilize to come back. Um, I don't foresee a huge, uh, much of a change in the actual construction because they've got plenty of work to do before they could even be in there. But um, so. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you for the explanation. Any additional discussion? Okay, we'll move on to the next item, uh, which is the action plan for board priorities. Superintendent Tate. Thank you, Mr. President. I tried to capture all of our discussion at the workshop concerning what we wanted, what you wanted to do as your initial actions on your two priorities, provide leadership and direction to improve the overall learning environment in classroom schools district, including health, safety, security, and happiness of students and staff. So I provided an, a draft action plan, again, which hopefully included uh, the things that you wanted to get started on that were important to you. And then I have a second plan for the priority of direct and support actions, programs, and activities which reduce the impact of poverty on students, their families, and our community. Uh, this is the way I usually attack issues and problems, but you need to feel comfortable. Is this the pace that you want to do? Is it too fast, too slow? Or would you rather have a group now take this and sit back and come up with your own board uh, desires on how you want to, to take action? So again, sort of a straw, straw person to you to uh, talk about and tell me where to go next. Okay, thank you for your work in preparing that. Is there a discussion? Well, there must be a little bit. This is pretty important. Uh, Director Dickman. It seems like the uh, discussion that we had uh, at our workshop was actually very well captured. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any additional comments? If not, um, I'll say, too, that I, I support the layout of both of these plans. Um, and I think we move ahead boldly uh, with what's been presented. Anything else? OK. We'll move on to. The next discussion item is budget discussion, Superintendent Tate. Thank you, Mr. President. The agenda committee has decided that we should start budget discussions early, and, and that was because several of the issues um, which the board have uh, had discussed last time, you said, well, we're not going to accept them this time, but let's uh, move forward with them. And the agenda committee decided two things we should talk about would be the uh, block schedule to traditional and increasing class size. So I would just like to have um, Mr. Scott review those. Again, no decision is supposed to be made. It's just a matter of uh, what are you thinking? Is there additional information you'd like for us to find for you to uh, consider at a later time? And we'll just continue to each time we meet. Again, the agenda committee will pick uh, which of the, the long list that I have started with that uh, you want to work with, plus additional items that you'll bring up as we discuss. So um, you have a class size increase, and then the uh, block to traditional schedule pieces of information that we handed out to you last time we were discussing them. So Mr. Scott? Um, Mr. Schneid and myself went through the class size increase and uh, evaluated all of the buildings and recommendation you see is I think you've seen before but as the high schools uh, increasing uh, their formula instead of 26 to 1 uh, would go to 27 which would basically take a teacher out of each building and that's your four teachers a middle school same thing that would we gain five teachers elementary uh, we talked about the classroom sizes maxing at uh, 23, 25, and 28. Uh, we would we would gain four teachers. We were very we wasn't a lot of a lot of savings there. Um, and then you see below just the totals um, that I've adjusted to basically the average salary of um, Marcia was 79,000 is what we're currently using. And then the reduction of classroom paras by the increase of uh, the elementary numbers 
uh, would reduce the amount of classroom pairs. Currently, they receive extra classroom pair hours uh, if they are over top of their current numbers, and so you would see savings there. Uh, any, if no questions on the first sheet, I'll move on to the second sheet. Okay. Any thoughts on um, what's been presented? Director Crumwitty. Yes, I have, a, I have a question about this, and I'm just curious as to what the rationale is. If you look at elementary and you look at the grades 4 and 5, the recommendation is 28 students. And then if you look at the middle schools, it goes down to 25, and then at the high school, 27. What's your rationale for staffing fourth and fifth grades at a higher level than middle schools or high schools? Um, the scheduling is not as clean as it is at the elementary level. At the elementary level, students are really together, and it's much easier to keep that class size at 28. I'm, I'm just going by what the information that I have. Um, but the high school, you, you'll have classes that have more than 30 kids in them. And then you'll have other classes that will have 20 in them because it's just not pure math. You can't just put them in little spots like that. And so I think that's where you come with that. Also at the middle school level, I know there are several middle school classes that have 30 in them already. Uh, but due to the scheduling uh, needs of the students, we can't always put them like we can at the elementary level. And um, the 28 number, I, I do think, is a, is it? that's why we didn't make any changes in the fourth and fifth grade level. We didn't feel comfortable moving that number any higher okay my other my other concern about the class sizes and I know many districts are increasing class sizes around but we also have a policy that is perhaps somewhat different than districts uh, that we allow that number to exceed 28 that if we have family members for example that number can go to 32 very easily uh, so if we increase it just by one um, it seems to me that this board is going to have to take a look at policy and uh, how we um, operate as far as transferring uh, numbers in. Because if you have, for example, if you have a first grader and second grader in their space available, but they also have a fourth grader, we automatically take the fourth grader. Is that correct or not correct? If the siblings are already there? Not necessarily. Um, depending on what the number is of the highest where they're going in, you know, if it's going like there's nothing higher than 28 in fourth or fifth grade. So we don't exceed 28 at any not, classroom not in this district. Not um, currently. No, I don't believe so. Uh huh. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that because I, I think that's not been true in the past. I think. No, they're right. It wasn't originally. So um, we we. We cap it at 28. So what happens when a fifth grader then moves into the Truman District and uh, wants to enroll in Truman and you already have 28? Do you automatically send them to another? Well, they, we did add para hours to some classrooms when they would get to over the limit, like a 28. Okay. There were para hours added. I, I don't believe there's any any section... There might have been a 29 at one time early on. I believe it was at Eisenhower, but I don't. I don't think so. Um, uh, Walcott, we ended up adding a teacher because the numbers got high, and it wasn't. There was no place else to bus them to. Okay. That that's one of the other draws. Is where else is there a spot available where there's transportation? Um, usually it was pair hours, adding pair hours. Okay. Top of class size. Thanks. Director Defa. And I would uh, concur with Director Crumwitty, and I do think that uh, we would, as a as a board, have to review our policies. and And I too am pleasantly surprised if it's the case that we aren't doing a plus two on these maximum class sizes for fourth and fifth grade, because I can say with confidence that none of my children had less than thirty students in their fourth or fifth grade classes ever, ever. Yeah. And that's four kids and. So that's eight, eight different classes. Um, and it's because we do have that situation where, okay, this is the max, but we'll go plus two and add a para and accommodate it in that manner. Um, and I do think we would have to 
really th think about that and make a firm cap. I also think that we're very generous in terms of um, accepting fam you know using that that maximum and accepting families as opposed to saying our fifth grade is capped so even though there'd be room for your first and third grader we're not going to allow you to transfer in because we can't accommodate everyone I mean I know there are some districts that do that I also know in Bettendorf they could care less if your kids are in the same building or not I mean they assign as they see fit so no offense Bettendorf but I do know that's the truth um, not suggesting for a minute that we go to that policy not suggesting for a minute but we don't necessarily have to do business as usual and uh, yeah I really think we're gonna have to be open to having hard discussions about a lot of things that we've been unwilling to talk about in the past and class size is one of those things um, for high schools, staffing is, is based on total FTE on enrollment, correct? That's correct. And then the principal assigns? Principal looks at the student request. Right. We wait for student requests to come back before we even do the staffing at the right. high school level. Okay. So, you know, that, that 26 or 27 isn't really, pre uh, as I said, precise because you're looking at the total building enrollment and determining FTE attribution to the building based upon that um, and that's really my comments anybody else director Dickman um, for the block schedule versus traditional schedule is there any way to have one or two of the high schools have traditional schedule and one or two of the high schools have block schedule Yes, there was would always be a way to have any options um, we did have that 10 years ago where we had one of our high schools still on traditional I want to say it was West High School would have been the last high school to come on to the block schedule so we have had that um, we currently at West have some freshman Academy which does do uh, more it's not the traditional model but it's a skinny model um, that would be um, from a staffing situation uh, you would be Technically, you'd be staffing one building on a traditional model for they would receive less staffing uh, FTE than you would another school on a block schedule and they would receive more FTE. Okay, so we could look at that as a potential cost savings without getting rid of all of block scheduling? If you wanted to have one building staffed differently than the other high school building, yes. Okay, would that create problems with staff? Um, I would, my, if you're asking me, yes, I think that would create some uh, difficulties. Yes. Okay. Director DeFau. Yeah, and um, I had a question in regard to the last two bullets under the traditional schedule uh, regarding the need to insert study halls into a traditional calendar and the need for additional para hours to cover duties currently handled by teachers. Um, if we were to move to a tradi traditional schedule, I would hope that we would be doing so because it was also in the academic best interest of students, and I don't know that creating study hall time as opposed to offering additional classes meets that criteria. Um, it's, I, go ahead. Yes. I really had the study hall there as more as an option for students. Um, and uh, there are going to be a few more scheduling conflicts in traditional because you have to fit seven different options in there than the block where you're really looking to get four pegs in. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes it a little more difficult. But the other schools that have the traditional, if you want to take seven periods, uh, you pretty much are okay doing it. There just may be a few kids that want to have a study hall. Okay. And so it's more of an option. I would not not think it would be widely used if we have uh, 1,500 kids in a high school. I you know maybe there would be 25 in a period uh, and that would be that would be the max that I would see that actually happening I, I just wanted as an option as far as information that there could be study halls I wouldn't want that information to come out later and then as far as the para hours we we have teachers at the high school because they teach um, a shorter amount of day they teach 75% of the day 
compared to the middle schools, they pick up a duty time. And that duty time, uh, it could be anything from watching the door to being in the library to resourcing for students and pair is to cover some of that time that would no longer be there for supervision. And so that's why I put that cost in there. Okay. Um, and um, in response to Director Dickman's suggestion, I'd be very concerned about negatively impacting enrollment in one building over another by offering block versus traditional in certain buildings. Um, as we've observed, change is hard. And, you know, I'd really hate to see a mass exodus from a building because we enforced a schedule that was not uniform. Um, now, I do know with that that north is offering a one two block and uh, yes and they're year. doing a a b block for next yes. year yes and that seems to me to be an alternative that isn't reflected here and that might be again that modified block concept i think would be something that i would be interested in looking at as another option right and and the, the research that I've done as far as putting the numbers together for you guys in the modified block there there's not a cost savings in the model that I've looked at uh, you can the a B block is uh, I, North Scott uses it I'm it is it is a good model also uh, but there's not any additional cost the teachers are still teaching 75 percent of the day they're teaching three out of four blocks um, whereas in a traditional they're going to teach about 85 percent of the day okay we need to put the number on the additional books too it's talking about yes. double so that will be considerable and we need to really have a net on this so i said let's do some increase. research on that okay were you done director de at this time okay additional discussion nobody <laughs> director crumody when we went to the block schedule those of us who are around at that time. It was my understanding one of the major reasons of going to the block schedule is that it was going to have more of a positive impact on student achievement. Has that been accomplished at all through the block schedule? I mean, can we actually say it has over these past several years really made a difference in academic achievement? I don't I don't I don't know that. I know that when I look at our matrix and I look at those, our high school scores are are in the green our students are doing um, well with that um, but again it's a it's a resource that is you know um, a definite advantage for four periods a day it's a but it costs more I mean I and I know we're not wanting to talk about it, but it come financially the block costs more than traditional and if we choose to keep that then there's great resources for that also you know to continue with the block I think students just like you've seen for the time change they like what they have mm -hmm. I don't know that they wouldn't like the traditional uh, either but um, it definitely our kids are doing well right now but would other kids benefit from that when we're looking at the entire 4600 high school students would they benefit mm -hmm. you know from the traditional I, I also remember that conversation that there was a lot of concern when we changed my children for example one of them got caught up in the transition but when we were making that change from the traditional schedule to the block schedule, there was a lot of concern about that change. And then, you know, it happened and it worked out. But um, I'm wondering, changing back, it's going to be a change for those people who are presently in the block schedule. But going back to the traditional schedule, we've done it before and there's a lot of districts doing it. And some some of the, th the resources that I would have to provide from a, the schedule building would be how could we partner classes so we still could have some of those tendencies of the block schedule through the traditional model uh, so that students could still get through their coursework, coursework at a timely fashion in a certain subject area, especially those that are already into high school. Anything else? Director Dickman. Sorry, uh, this might be an idea that isn't feasible or has been thrown all out already, but um, uh, the freshmen take skinny courses. Is that, are those half of the, the block schedule? So would it theoretically be possible to have um, teachers have three blocks and two skinnies and teachers teach one of the skinnies so that they're teaching 85% of the day 
um, and then those skinnies would last an entire semester instead of just a quarter. Is that would that provide us cost savings in the same manner? Um, Is that yes, the if block? teachers were teaching, basically they'd be teaching seven eighths of the day. Okay, that's what you're talking about. Yes. Yes, there's definitely a cost savings to that um, because instead of six eighths, they're teaching now seven eighths of the day. There is cost saving. You come into with that type of modified block, you would have more scheduling conflicts because teachers won't only be available for a skinny during this time, but then a block that time, and so you would come in to more things. But that that would be an option. Okay. Um, they would be probably teaching um, more time than anybody. Then they would go from where they're at now to having more contact time than the middle schools. I think 87.5, I think, if I remember right, what that would be, because I have looked at that model. I don't, don't check my math on that. It's late. It, it, Director Defa. As we're talking about these two different schedules and looking at the uh, traditional schedule and the bullet that references that students will have fewer elective classes, um, I think that one thing that we can do as a board to perhaps free up some curricular time is to have the conversation about uh, allowing varsity athletics, show choir, and marching band qualify as uh, PE courses. Many, many districts throughout the state do that. And, um, you know, that would certainly give back the students that would give class. Uh, when we would go from the 28 maximum to 32, that would pick up, uh, basically it'd pick up a block all year long you'd pick up without the PE. You probably would still have to take some health, so we'd have to figure out how health would fall in there, but you clearly would pick up three blocks for sure uh, during their high school career. Yeah, I think somebody only needs to uh, have a varsity athlete or a show choir participant or marching band participant to recognize that the amount of energy expended in those exceeds that of PE class. No offense to any PE teacher in the district. Anything else? Um, <clears throat> I just have a couple of comments. First, I appreciate the discussion that the board has had on this. And remember that what we're trying to do is to, to give the administration some idea of where we are as a board. In the future, there will be recommendations made on these various topics that we talk about, <clears throat> and it'll be based to some extent on, on the administration's and superintendent's interpretation of our discussion on these various items. And, and so what I've heard tonight uh, is that the board isn't strongly opposed to either one of these ideas. And <clears throat> so I just want to make sure that's, is that similar to Superintendent Tate, to what you've heard? Um, what I've heard is at least keep them on the list. Uh, no one is standing up and saying I will vote for that, but um, I will certainly keep them on the list and we need to do some cleanup work and provide some other information. Thank you. Uh, Director Cool. Yeah, I prefer Dr. Tate's uh, interpretation that keep it on the list. I am not, um, I'm strongly opposed to going back to the traditional schedule, but I recognize that we have financial constraints. Um, but this is one that, uh, that I would certainly not want to discontinue. I mean, it, the one thing by itself is under the block schedule, you have 75 students and parents for teachers to contact per quarter versus with the traditional schedule, 150 students and parents for teachers to contact per quarter. Again, to me, that puts students on an assembly line, teachers in a, in a mode where they're seeing so many students that they can't possibly develop the kinds of relationships that can be done under the block schedule. So I have significant concerns in terms of the quality of education, as, as Mr. Scott had, had mentioned. I mean, uh, we're paying for it, but uh, the indication is, the research is that I've read is that it is of value. It is an achievement-related goal, and we've done things on this board already in, eliminate, in eliminating middle school time. Uh, we have taken back from some of the programs that boards in the past have said these are what we need to make student achievement. So I want to be very careful 
uh, and selective in terms of the cuts that we have to make. And this is one that I'm not there on yet. Thanks. I just wanted to clarify that. No, I, I appreciate the clarification because I hadn't heard any strong opposition to either of these. Uh, any ad oh, Director Snyder. I guess just to clarify uh, my position as well is that uh, when we're looking at four and a half million dollars, I think it's premature to take anything off the list, no matter uh, how much we're opposed to it or in favor of it. Um, there's going to be a lot of very unfavorable decisions that we're going to have to make, and four and a half million dollars is a lot of money, and it's going to take a lot of change to get us there. Anything else? Um, Oh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, traditional and black because going back to those original discussions and decisions, and earlier I think uh, Director Crumwoody asked about um, has, has the change affected the kind of change that we were told that we would see, especially with respect to student achievement. And I think that's what Director Kluhl was r referencing, although he was talking about research as well. And I think that there must be a way, even if, even if we just looked at student achievement from whatever that means, but some type of thinking about what student achievement meant when we were on the traditional, and then as we made these changes to the blocks or two block schedules, and it was implemented at the schools at various times. And so I would think that there should be a clear indication of student achievement and that the block, if it accomplished those things that it was supposed to, <coughs> that the student achievement would continue to increase in some measurable way. So if there's a way to support that idea in the future and uh, some way to measure it, uh, I would look forward to that. Um, because I think it's true that even though we need to find the money, it's really hard to say we're going to save this money at the expense of student achievement. So if we can, if we can at least demonstrate or prove that it would help me uh, I'm very neutral on this particular subject, but I'd like to see what the data supports. Uh, Director Kluhl. Just one follow-up thought. I, I've, I've been concerned for some time about the fidelity with which we apply um, the block schedule in terms of, as Adam mentioned earlier, with a, uh, a lecture period and a collaboration period and then an opportunity for students to do homework in the class. Um, Anecdotally, what I've heard across the board is that we don't um, really follow that schedule in a lot of classrooms, and I think that part of the power of, of the block schedule is doing that and not uh, using it for watching movies and, and some of the things that I've heard go on. I think it's a very powerful tool, but I don't think that we've applied it uniformly. Is a, a comment, a thought on that? I would even say his interpretation, uh, I, several teachers I know are doing three different activities and the last activity isn't just doing their homework at the end of that. They're doing an activity in the first 25 minutes, a different activity in the middle where maybe it's group, and then the teacher's bringing it back to the area where I see teachers teaching up to the very end. And so I wouldn't want the impression to be that the last half an hour is always just homework time at the high school. And doing and my site visits in all of our high school buildings, I would say that's accurate. Teachers are teaching. so. Breaking that out in three models, can we do some educati education as related to that? I agree with that. We can talk more about to better utilize the block. And I suspect that part of that is, uh, the, is the climate issue that the board has established pr a priority on. Um, uh, one of the issues that we talked about is that uh, students wouldn't have the time to do uh, their homework under uh, the pros for the, uh, the time schedule that has been approved by the board. But if we truly were, uh, allowing students the opportunity to use that for homework, that 30 minutes for homework time, it would be one of those adoptive things that we're able to do to mediate the impact, the negative impact to students and parents. 
So it's something that I continue to hope that we will work with professional development or whatever it takes to uniformly uh, manage our, our, uh, our block period schedules. Any additional discussion? Um, I, I do have to respond, <clears throat> going back to the fidelity issue and the sense, and I think my understanding way back all those years ago was that the way it, I recall it being presented is not that the block was going to be used for uh, homework. Um, my interpretation is that it was supposed to be used for um, teaching. So that might be something that we've got to get a clarification even on what it actually was supposed to be anyway so and maybe what it is or what it should be well what it what it should be I think is is a totally different conversation than how it was sold to the board at the time I think we could have additional discussion on what it should be but we should understand what the way that it was represented but I think everybody everything points to the fact that, that we should look for the way that it should be if, if it was presented as, as some in some way in the past, that's fine, but we certainly want to incorporate whatever it is that will lead the highest level of student achievement. And if it's changed since the original board uh, pre presentation, uh, then let's move forward with the current research, because certainly research has changed since the original block schedule uh, breakdown has been uh, provided. Uh, th that's, that's my thought on it, that the room for, for room for discussion on that issue. Obviously. Okay, so the administration will have to take those comments for whatever the value they have. Any additional discussion on this issue? Seeing none, we'll move ahead with administrative reports. None, Mr. President. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move to board reports and requests. I have um, a few board requests. But are there any board reports before I get to these? Yes, Mr. Director President. Director Crumody. It was uh, brought to my attention this past weekend uh, concerning the passing of uh, Bob, Bob McHugh. Uh, Bob McHugh was a longtime administrator in this district uh, as an elementary principal. And then after he retired, as many of us know, he went on the school board, was a school board member for a number of years and school board president for a number of years. And um, Bob, uh, about a year ago, uh, moved to up to Sumner, Iowa, near his sister because of his health situation. Uh, Bob passed away at the age of 97 years. And uh, he also was the founder of the Davenport Community School District Museum, which is in the lower level of this building, and Bob worked tirelessly of um, getting artifacts for that museum and um, worked for many, many years collecting those artifacts and then getting people involved uh, with the museum, which is um, really a, an asset to our district. His uh, obituary will be in tomorrow's paper and uh, what I was told is that the memorials are going to go to the uh, Davenport Museum. So I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. Thank you. Any other board reports? Director Dickman. Uh, yesterday I had the opportunity to stop by the Figgy to see the artwork from many of the Davenport students. Um, and the kids were all really excited showing off their, their various pieces of art that were on display to parents and grandparents. Um, and they were getting awards for um, the opportunity to come and do extra projects at the Figgy. Uh, and I just want to say that I think it's wonderful that the, the, the Davenport schools and the Figgy have been able to work together in such a way so that we're able to offer this opportunity to our students. Thank you. Uh, Director Snyder. Um, last week, uh, myself and Director Dickman um, attended the uh, art open house at Eisenhower, and I want to congratulate those kids on uh, a very well put together um, 
evening. Uh, there was a lot of Sudlow kids there helping out as well. I commend them. Um, and then we attended the retirement and uh, um, milestone uh, awards uh, ceremony later that evening. And my congratulations to them as well. Um, I also was able to attend three, I believe, three of the elementary uh, school presentations on the Arts Academy that are upcoming. And uh, there was a lot of uh, really good feedback from those, so that's going to be exciting to see where that heads. Um, I, uh, I think at the last meeting we were out here at about 11:30, so I didn't offer up my board report, but I did attend uh, a musical at North as well as a musical at Central, and uh, they had asked me to come and sing the lead in those productions, but I was not available. I apologize. <laughs> Um, it's been a busy uh, time with the schools, and there's a lot of good things going on out there. Any other reports? Before I get to the requests, you know, I, I wanted to just comment that uh, I really appreciate all of the effort that the administration and teachers and everybody has put into all of this work and you know, we had a, a lot of information and yep there were some uh, tough discussions or tough decisions i should say um so i wanted to thank all of you for the work that you do um and i can only imagine how challenging it must be to try to accommodate the board's needs i want to thank the board as well for uh, the thoughtful uh, discussion and decisions that it makes. With that, I have four uh, board requests. First is from Director DeFile for 29. Is that today's date? Oh, I thought it was 28th. Okay, that's all right. I'll put it down 428, <laughs> 14. Uh, an agenda item, discussion as to whether the board envisions discussing the elimination of the of any. of any elective curriculum as we determine the budget in the next year. Second request is from Director Snyder, 428-14 information request. When are final announcements scheduled to be made in regards to paras and other personnel in regards to employment for next year? I know of pairs that are still uncertain if they will have a job next year. Next um, request from Director DeFau, uh, dated 428-14. This is an agenda item. Uh, I would like the board to discuss permanently moving the regular board meeting start time to 6.30 during the school year and 6 o'clock during the summer. Uh, a uh, request from board member Johansson dated 428-14 agenda item discuss curriculum and digital resources from a strategic perspective it's just barely past 1030 and I would entertain a motion to adjourn <laughs> so move Tomorrow night, 6 o'clock, North Suicide Prevention Program. Mm. Very important. Thank you for that reminder. Now is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Thanks. All those in favor say aye. Aye. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>